right, we're on the record. Good morning. Today is um, July 17th. We are here for the uh, annual appeals board meeting. Let's see, will Brandon please take roll call? Thank you. Uh, for assessment appeals board number one, uh, board member Farino? Present. Board member Ferris? Present. And board member Sisk? Present. For assessment appeals board two, board member Lunetta? Present. Board member Cam? Present. Board member Little? Present. Thank you. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Can okay, now we have the election of chair and vice chair to the assessment of appeals board number one? So this is a uh, chair for board one, which would be uh, board members uh, Sisk and Freno. Uh, between the two of you, we'll need a chair and vice chair. Uh, by September, we expect to have a third regular board member appointed. Okay. I nominate Anthony Freno for vice chair. And I nominate you for chair. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now we have the election. Are we ready to move on, Brian, or do you need to? Uh, yes, excellent. Okay. okay. A election of chair and vice chair for appeals board number two. I nominate uh, Mr. Lanetta as chair for board two. And I will nominate um, uh, Patty for um, vice chair. <laughs> Thank you. Accepted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations, Mr. Lunetta. Um, okay. We're going to skip number six for now, and we're going to trail it after item 12. So next we have the assessor's presentation. Are we ready for that one yet? If Mr. Bates, if you'd like to come forward to the podium. We have Steve Bates with the assessor's office here today. Good morning, board and county council and clerk of the board. Um, on behalf of the assessor's office, we would just like to thank all of you for your hard work that you put into um, everything that you do for the assessor's office and for the taxpayers of Ventura County. And we just appreciate all of that. We're looking forward to uh, a new year and um, we have a lot of cases moving forward. So uh, we look forward just to um, all the work that, that, that you do for us. So um, my presentation, it's not an actual presentation, it's just an introduction to our team. And so I wanted to just start off, um, I'm gonna ask everyone to just stand up individually as I introduce them. And so the first one is Brooke Hill, and she's our chief appraiser. She's my boss, and she's the one that keeps us everything. She keeps everything in order, keeps everything in order, and she's worked for the assessor's office for 17 years and an appeals total for 13 years. So she really has a lot of experience, and um, we appreciate her for all the work that she does. Um, for myself, um, I am the supervising appraiser in appeals, and I've worked for the assessor's office for 18 years. Um, I worked for the county overall for about 24 years, but the assessor, uh, 18 years, and uh, in appeals, this is my this will be my second year as the supervisor. But total of uh, this will be my fifth year in appeals, just total. And um, looking forward to a good year. And um, I want to introduce Joe Phillips if he can stand, and he is our appraiser three. He's had 11 years of experience in our office, and this is his fifth year in appeals. Um, he will continue to handle the assisted living facilities, um, golf courses, hospitals, shopping centers. And he's taking on a new assignment this year, which is our change in ownership. So we're looking forward to that. So thank you, Joe. Um, also, we have a new member to the appeals team. He's not new to the office, but he's new to appeals, Zachary Clifford and he's an appraiser three. He has five years in the assessor's office and he's just starting out in, in appeals. However, he does have a, an extensive background of a, being a fee appraiser before coming to the assessor's office. So he has a lot of experience under his belt. So um, he'll be handling um, mainly commercial properties, commercial properties this year. So thanks, Zach. Mm -hmm. um, Todd Court. He is our auditor appraiser three, and I think he has the most experience in our office. He has 22 years 
<laughs> of experience in the assessor's office and he's been in appeals. This will be his fifth year and he handles all of our personal property and he'll continue to do that for the year. Thanks, Todd. And uh, Joe Vernon, he's actually um, Auditor Appraiser 3. He's um, on vacation right now. So he uh, handles our aircraft and boats. So he is our Auditor Appraiser who handles that. He'll continue to do that this year. Audrey Ramirez, she's our appraiser too. And she will, so she actually has worked in the office for seven years, and this is her third year in appeals. Um, she will continue to handle residential properties, but she's taking on a couple of new assignments this year, and that is industrial and exemptions. So thanks, Audrey. Uh, Scott Bradley, he is our appraiser too. And he has 16 years of experience in the assessor's office. Uh, this will be his third year in appeals. And he'll continue to handle residential properties, but he's also taking on rural Prop 19s and calamities this year. So thank you, Scott. Uh, Richie Ramirez, he's our office assistant too. He has three years in the assessor's office. This is his uh, third year. He'll be starting his third year in appeals. And so he handles our support desk and exemption. So he's the one that keeps all, um, he works closely with um, Brendan and um, he helps keep things in order. So thank you, Richie. And then last, we have Ryan Kazmierczuk. He is our intern and he is participating in the County of Ventura Student Summer Internship Program. So he's with us today. So um, thank you, Ryan. And that's pretty much it. That's all that I have with introductions. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next item, approval of the 2024 assessment and appeals hearing calendar. Thank you. All right. So uh, I've passed out to all the board members a copy of the proposed calendar. Just real briefly, a history on this. So um, it's very similar to what your 2023 calendar ended up being. So uh, on the screen, I have what was originally adopted with seven hearings for each board and six special hearing dates plus the annual meeting. Uh, what we ended up with um, at the end of this year is both boards still had seven regular hearings. Um, we increased the special hearings to seven and then the annual meeting today was also converted to a special hearing uh, due to the amount of cases uh, in the backlog due to COVID-19. As the coming year approaches, we do still have a lot of cases that are just taking longer to resolve that have been on hold uh, prior to COVID-19, a number of them also requiring special hearings. Uh, so for the coming year, we are recommending a very similar calendar as the prior year, where each board will have seven hearings and we'll have spe seven special hearings set aside. And if it becomes necessary, we can turn next year's annual meeting into additional special hearing um, we're hoping as the year pans out that some of these hearings may be able to be canceled. We were able to do that with a few of your regular hearings this past year, uh, but we don't know what the coming year uh, appeal filings will bring. So this assumes that our um, prior year caseloads will remain the same and that new filings for this year will um, continue. We do have a number of cases scheduled for special hearings scheduled to resolve at the end of this year. And so if all goes smoothly, we may be able to um, decrease the amount of special hearings for 2024. Unless there's any questions, uh, we would request the board approve the calendar as presented. Any questions? I right, so move. Second. All right, it sounds like we have a motion by board member Sisk, second by board member Ferris. And I'll now do a roll call vote for approval of the 2024 calendar. Board member Cam. Approved. Board member Farino. Approved. Board member Ferris. Approved. Board member Lunetta. Approved. Board member Little. Aye. Board member Sisk. Approved. Thank you. Okay. Next item, number nine, receive and file summary report for active assessment appeal applications in which the two-year final determination deadline has passed or will soon pass. 
Thank you. So we've uh, presented a report to your board and just brief summary of the older cases. Again, uh, COVID-19 continues to affect our workload. Uh, the hearing schedule is picking up speed, but as you saw over the last several months, we've been hearing very old cases and getting caught up. Um, one thing we'll note for the two-year waiver report, um, the two-year expiration that we've reported is the direct calendar uh, calculation of two years from when the application was filed. Um, and so there are uh, quite a number of cases nearing that, um, only slightly more than this point last year. Um, but we did just want to um, express that the, the two-year exact calculation is not the actual deadline. Um, they are extended to two years from when the filing period closes for each individual application. There were uh, further, the legislature did further extension for the time during COVID when emergency proclamations were in place. And if an application is incomplete and we have given notice or an applicant has been requested data from the assessor under 441D and not complied, the two-year waiver period is automatically extended in all those circumstances. And then further, applicants uh, can waive their period. The reason we don't calculate it on their true deadline is there's very, these various factors and it's very labor intensive. And um, there's a lot of cases. So what we, if it came down to it um, where there was, say, a challenge to the two-year period, we would determine that actual deadline and there would be a hearing to discuss and confirm that with your boards. Um, but as today's, this is just the straight two-year deadline from two-year period from when the application was filed and that's how we normally process based on. So on your screen, you know, we have 689 applications uh, nearing the two-year period from when they were originally filed. Um, Again, just slightly up from last year, the vast majority of those are business property appeals that are going to be resolved in special hearings throughout the main year of this calendar year. Following is commercial industrial appeals. And then we just have a handful of residential boat aircraft, vacant land, and possessory interest cases. So we just wanted to show you the breakdown, how this is. Uh, so this will be reflected in how the remainder of the year pans out for hearings you can you know, generally expect to see more business and commercial appeals as we proceed through the coming year. Uh, so if there's not any, not any questions, um, we would just request a motion to receive and file. Mm -hmm. I so move. Second. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and if there are no objections to that motion, we can just call that unanimously approved. Hearing none. Thank you. Okay, next item, discussion on remote attendance options and utilization for assessment appeals board and hearing officer meetings. Thank you. Uh, we had this item on your board's agenda last year, and we just wanted to bring it back to revisit and, and get updated instruction from the board. Um, so these are, again, the same slides that were presented to you last year. We first began remote meetings in April 2020. And then two years later, we came back to hybrid in-person remote meetings, which we've been doing since. Um, again, there's various rules uh, by the State Board of Equalization guiding the process, which were included in your packet as exhibit one for this item. Um, currently, your boards are offering attendance in person by Zoom or telephone. Uh, the hearing date confirmation form that we require applicants to fill out requires them to indicate um, what type of hearing they would prefer. Uh, per the evidence uh, instructions and how to participate are emailed uh, to all applicants 14 to 20 days ahead in addition to all the other literature that they receive regarding the hearing. Uh, because taxpayers have the right to request an in-person hearing, as does the assessor have the right to request an in-person hearing, all board members, staff, and assess assessor's representatives attend these in person uh, with limited exceptions. Um, applicants presenting cases currently uh, are strongly encouraged to attend in person but have the option to attend in remote uh, if they need to. Again, the challenges and benefits haven't changed since last year. There's additional preparation work. It is uh, extra coordination to receive the exhibits in advance. Um, 
We still have communication issues with applicants indicating how they are going to attend and, and sticking with that. Um, those remote participants uh, have to be prepared two days earlier to make sure we have everything prior to the Monday morning hearing. Um, but there are still benefits. The, uh, they can, applicants can request continuances without traveling. Um, applicants waiting for their case to be heard all day don't have to sit in the room. There's more flexibility for scheduling with people who may have trouble taking off work or um, be traveling. Uh, and we've, de I think it's picked up again, but in general, there's been fewer denials due to lack of appearance and reconsideration requests because of the flexibility to attend. Um, so what we'd like to request from this point is, you know, any comments from the board, how would you like to proceed for the following year? We can continue with hybrid hearings as is. Um, many counties have switched to requiring everybody to be in person and not offering any sort of remote attendance option. Um, which is another thing your board could choose to do. Uh, you could you know, also do anything in between. You could require all cases to be presented in person, uh, but still allow administrative matters to be remote, such as continuances and amendment requests. Or you can require everyone attend in person unless someone makes a special request to your board and it be approved. So if, if your board chooses to go with one of the midway options this year, we would work on uh, how those procedures would flush out and how someone would request uh, remote attendance. Uh, so that's it from the clerk of the board and, and we're welcome any feedback from the board at this point on how you'd like to proceed for the coming year. Okay, I personally, I feel that the administrative matters can be solved via Zoom. It, it lessens the people in the court, it saves them time, especially if they have to travel from LA to come up here and spend you know 10 minutes watching us talk and five minutes asking a question and then they drive home. But anything that needs to be presented, I feel needs to be in person because evidence is really difficult via Zoom. And there's certainly something lost in the presentation on the applicant side because there's just a little bit of a communication gap. Yeah. That's my personal opinion. I agree also, fellow board members. I agree as well. Okay. Um, Brendan, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, have there been, um, a lot of tech issues that have uh, interrupted the uh, the remote meetings? Not as far as our connection go <laughs> in or anything like that or anything from the county's end. I think most of the technological issues tend to be people that aren't familiar with how to use their computers or that call in and are um, doing other things such as grocery shopping or something instead <laughs> of actually being attentive to the hearing. Yes. Um, but in general, we haven't had connection issues. I, we send out instructions on how to join and how someone can test on their own. Um, anyone who's told us they're coming, we call and talk to every single one of them and make sure they don't have any questions. And then the uh, Thursday before the meeting, we send out the agenda, which also, again, has the connection instructions on it. So really, the, the technological issues are um, would be from the applicant side and just them not knowing how to personally use their own technology. Um, and so that's, that's the only real issue we've noticed. Um, are they advised at all on advantages and disadvantages of presenting remotely? We don't really go mm. into that much detail. I mean, if someone wants to question the, the proceeding, we'll definitely discuss it with them. But um, in general, we just you know, tell people they're encouraged to attend in person, but a lot of people like to still opt for that remote hearing. As you've seen, I think more cases are now in person, but we do have some people that still request uh, remote. And those people generally tend to be from outside the Ventura area, either in East County or our, uh, say, a professional representative presenting from outside of the county. Mm -hmm. I think I've noticed if people are in the Ventura or Oxnard area, they generally will come in person. It's, it's just my observation. Okay. I wonder if, based on what you've said, and I had the same sort of thought, that maybe we can make an exception for properties under a certain amount from the East County. I'm thinking about if I'm a residential owner and I'm just thinking there's $200,000 difference between me and the assessor, it's not worth coming all the way into Ventura for a whole day to, to argue it, but we want to give them there. We don't, we don't want to punish them for not being, not living yeah. in the Ventura area. I mean, what we could do is, is just, 
this is just one option, require everyone attend in person and then have a way that, say, uh, when, if someone's requesting a continuance, they can maybe indicate, uh, due to their unique circumstances, they want to request a remote hearing. And then the board, as part of the continuance, can um, approve that request uh, and then otherwise require uh, pre people to attend in person. So we would, in that example, we would modify our literature to indicate that in-person attendance is required, uh, but for administrative matters, say, such as requesting a, an extension, you can attend via Zoom, and if you need to um, request special accommodation for a remote hearing, that would need to be done you know, at the administrative discussion beforehand. Um, that way we would give flexibility and the board could judge based on the individual circumstances and complexity. Um, because it still comes down to even if um, the you know, the applicant wants a remote hearing, if the board or the assessor deems that it's better for remote, then we have to have the hearing remote, uh, re I mean in person, rem the remote attendance option is a um, benefit that is not required. That sounds reasonable. Yeah. Um. I think it's good to have that exception for, particularly for continuances. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. Uh, um, this is a, a question to to Brendan, but also the, the board members. Do you feel that um, by providing the way it is now, the option to do it remotely, that we get some people who, um, uh, for lack of a better term, are kind of wasting their time and hours, <laughs> as opposed to if they had to come in, they would mm -hmm. take it more seriously? Does anyone have a, feeling, a thought yeah. about that? Like basically, essentially what I'm saying is that if you have to go through the, the process of coming in to present a case, um, you're less likely to be shopping <laughs> while you're doing, doing your presentation, um, which again, seems like a burden on, on uh, everyone involved. Anyone have a comment on that? Seems the people who want to come in and uh, complain are gonna come in and complain. <laughs> they really oh, want the forum. Right. <laughs> I haven't seen I haven't seen too much waste of time okay. on the remote, but I think it is a, a very important tool for continuances yeah. and administrative I matters. Agree. So okay. I think we should continue with the hybrid. But um, okay. but we'll allow an exception for people who want to make a request for yes. because they're either far away or they have access issues or. Or scheduling issues, yeah, disabilities. Yeah. yeah. So we'll proceed with that, and, and your board can always direct you know, us to change it if it's not working, and um, we'll probably place it on the uh, annual meeting again next year for another annual check-in and, and see if the board wants to make any adjustments at that time as well. Okay, and okay. one, Mr. Chair, one uh, final comment. Uh, what about the workload on the clerk of the board? You, um, our uh, staffing has... Uh, we have sufficient staffing allocations to handle the additional um, workload. Um, while it is more work, we are uh, prepared and willing to handle that. Okay, excellent, thank you. And you have done an excellent job. <laughs> yes. This has been some uh, unusual times and you have accommodated <laughs> us be above you. and beyond. <laughs> All right, uh, so I think we've got the direction from the board. Unless there's any other comment, we won't require any uh, motion at this time. Okay. Okay, so next item, 11, uh, public comments. Is there any public comments? Everyone present today is either here for an agenda <laughs> item or a member of staff, so I believe we can proceed okay. to board comments. Do we have any comments from the board? I have a couple. Yep. Um, First of all, County Council's office, thank you so much for your guidance this past year. I know we've, I think we've had a record number of findings of fact, and I, I think you're probably, you've been swamped, <laughs> I'm sure, and you've done an excellent job, and we really appreciate you. And, um, and then uh, one thing for the clerk's office, I know we're, um, pursuing our recruitment again for new board members. And uh, I was thinking if um, it might be possible to uh, send some flyers out. There are some, uh, there's a real estate, couple of real estate companies out there. I know one is called uh, Paradise Printing in Newberry Park. 
and they send flyers out to all the real estate agents in all the different offices. I'm not sure if they do commercial, industrial, or appraisal offices or lending institutions, but I thought that might be a good tool for your recruitment because uh, that would go directly to the real estate industry. And uh, yep. a lot of those people have some good knowledge. Yep. Uh, um, I made note to do so. We do, uh, for our recruitments, historically reach out to the uh, realtors associations locally as well as some other professional organizations. Um, so we will um, also make note to look into that additional method of distribution. Mm -hmm. um, last recruitment, I think we sent out over 800 emails uh, to various professionals in various uh, professional organizations. So it, it, we're more than happy to add an additional organization to the list and try to get that word out there. Yeah, that, okay, yeah, you're, uh, the Board of Realtors, I think that's an excellent idea I because think, they maintain all of the email addresses. Yes, they do. Now, I have, I'm, you know, board member of there too, um, and I don't recall receiving emails sent out to the general membership about the post last time. So I can, I know the president, I can reach out to people. Yeah, because uh, we know. reached out to the, uh, uh, I don't have the list handy to me, but we, you know, historically our list includes the appraisal associations, the bar associations, the realtor associations, the chambers of commerce for all cities in the county, our entire database of professional tax representatives, and so forth, um, though we do then rely on those um, you know, general info, you know, receipt mailboxes to then distribute the information out. But I can definitely follow up on exactly who our distribution list uh, was previously and, and update your board on that. Okay. And um, also I was thinking uh, perhaps the local newspaper, the Acorn, under their now hiring section might be a, a nice little ad to put in there as well. Um, and then my third and final point is I'd, um, I'd kind of like the um, clerk to advise me or the board how to um, approach the idea of considering an upward adjustment on the stipends for the board. <laughs> <laughs> um, we will, um, as I'll get into during our presentation, we, we're a little bit short staffed at the time, but it is on our list to research current market rates for board member stipends and see if um, adjustments uh, can be made and, and potentially present, present those to the county executive officer and, and the board of supervisors. So okay. it is one of our pending projects to look into along with revising findings of fact fees um, to better account for yes. current market conditions and, and other matters. So uh, we just unfortunately have not had the opportunity to look into that further at the level of research it requires. Yeah. So it is on our list and hopefully within the next uh, few months we'll be able to look into that further. Okay. Yeah, I believe that topic came up in the Board of Supervising meeting that you sent us last year. Yes. One yes. of the board members did present that. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I That's have good. time for another. Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay, all right. Uh, had a couple of thoughts on the for the assessor's office um, on the change of ownership cases. I'd kind of like to see if it's possible that um, when we do have a change of ownership case, if maybe you could create some sort of a graph or a timeline that would. Um, show us how the changes occurred, and then as supporting evidence to that, uh, copies of the grant deeds. Change of ownership um, cases are a little more involved and, and I think need a little um, more detailed information for us to understand exactly what has occurred. So just an idea for the assessor's office. And then um, for residential applications, I was wondering if perhaps a, an example of a, um, a comp worksheet would be helpful to supply to the residential applicants. I know they have difficulty understanding adjustments especially, so I think if they had a worksheet like the assessor uses that just says example, they don't have to use it, but just an idea, 
that had all the, the columns, you know, showing comp one, two, and three, and then showing them how to adjust the comparable properties. Because it seems like we've seen a lot of applicants this year simply going to the general area and getting some comps and then coming up with a price per square foot and simply adjusting their property to the price per square foot on a general um, format, which I don't think is appropriate. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, and then uh, the, the third and final thing that I was thinking about was the issue of economic obsolescence that we've dealt with this year on the, especially the big box stores versus the online shopping. And um, I'm wondering if perhaps we can look into something as far as just a straight line depreciation, a simplified method, because it seems that when we use factors and, and um, oh, the, the current methodologies using factors, um, it kind of allows the applicants a chance to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, and get creative with their approaches. So I think that's an item that is going to come up more this, this next year as we, I think we're gonna be looking at a lot more commercial industrial type properties. So um, just, just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. I can respond real quickly to one of board member little uh, suggestions. Uh, I know those are mainly for the assessor as well. Uh, we do per put out a bunch of literature to the applicants. Um, not all of it gets read. But for those um, that want an example of how to prepare their appraisal, um, we do um, on our website provide publication 30, which is a state board of equalization publication. And Publication 30, uh, you saw this in a, uh, some of you may have seen this in a presentation the other day. There is an example grid. Um, uh, here we go on the screen. And it is, um, of course, it's not filled out with numbers or anything, but then the state does give instructions to the taxpayer on how to complete that. Um, so we do make that available on our website uh, and refer uh, taxpayers there um, when they have questions about how to complete a comparable sales analysis. Uh, we, we have a lot of literature, and unfortunately, just a lot of it doesn't get um, dug into U by the applicants. Utilized, yes, yeah. yeah. And perhaps if, if there was a little pamphlet that as the cases are being worked in the assessor's office, that form could just be directly handed to the, the applicant. So, Thank before you. before you answer though, uh, and we go down this rabbit hole, I, I think county council should work with you because you're setting a precedent. You know, you're presenting them with something that they can say, "Well, this is what the assessor gave me." Yeah. And I, if I'd known that I didn't do it this way, then I would have won my case. And so I think that's where county council needs. If we're going to give them anything other than, I agree it's a problem because they do come in here with some oddball, what you call quote and unquote appraisals. Yeah. But I uh, comment on the topic that if you want to, Miss Hill, if you want to mm -hmm. jump in, did you have something to say? I, I just wanted to thank you for your uh, suggestions. Um, I, we will definitely take all of those under advisement. Uh, with regards to uh, the publication 30 that um, Mr. Vlahakis brought up, um, I think we could very easily incorporate um, a link or something like that in the 441D letter that we send to residential mm -hmm. property owners. That way it's not really from us. We're just guiding them to the State Board of Equalization documentation on how the State Board of Equalization suggests that um, mm -hmm. it be it yes. be prepared. Yeah. Um, so we, we can definitely do that. Um, with regards to economic obsolescence, that's certainly um, an issue that comes up, like you said, particularly on the big, big box uh, retail stores for the personal property. Um, it is an issue. Um, we 
are trying to address it the best way that we can, given the guidance from the State Board of Equalization. So um, we, we do keep up with that as much as we can. Um, there are a couple conferences every year. We, we brainstorm with, with our colleagues in, in other counties to try to, to figure out how to best address that issue. But I, I agree, it is a complex issue. Um, so we'll, we'll think of that. And I know that um, on your first issue for change in ownership, uh, Joe, I think, is an expert at presentations, and I know that he will incorporate um, your suggestions and make sure that we, uh, we provide an easy-to-follow case for you and add those components for you. So we're happy to do that. Great. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. Okay. So I have a question. Um, in that publication 30 or anywhere in something that the uh, that Board of Equalization publishes, does it actually tell the applicant to go get an appraiser, to find an appraiser and have their home appraised or their property appraised? Is there no. a specific direction? There is no, um, nothing requiring that. And uh, we often get people concerned, like, say it's cost prohibitive to get an appraiser. You know, why would I have to do that? And we do reassure them that they um, are not legally required to hire an appraiser and they can um, uh, do it on their own if, if they choose to. I, and so I, I see where, you know, that would maybe cause some issues, but we... Yeah, the, the state board prefers that we you know, let the taxpayer make the decision and, and they are not required to have an appraiser. Uh, they are held to the same standards as the board and, and the assessor, of course, under the law, but um, yeah, uh, currently there's no guidance. Uh, in fact, we can't even recommend appraisers or professional tax representatives and we'll get that you know how do I find somebody how do I find comps and unfortunately we just have to say you'll have to go do some internet research you know google uh, you know uh, comps or you know, a professional tax representative because there really isn't um, assistance available and, and we have to remain neutral in in providing assistance to the taxpayers and applicants okay. what about providing a link to like a national registry so a, an applicant could punch in their zip code and find all the appraisers? Because the National Registry would be better than the Institute page, because the Institute page is going to lead everyone to me. <laughs> and I can't do that. <laughs> I, have, I just have to refer it away, because that's what I do. Whenever I get calls, I refer them. Yeah. Um, something to that effect, because I have a feeling that um, a number of appraisal foundations and associations would probably have an issue with the Board of Equalization attempting to teach consumers how to use a market grid with or without adjustments because they're untrained so yeah. that's you know that's yeah uh, we'll make note and, and discuss with our uh, the people at the boe who give us the guidance for what we do and, and county council and determine if if we could put a registry lookup um that may be possible because it wouldn't necessarily recommending anybody in in particular right because um, they're, they're simple it's like not an issue we previously yeah. explored so right. we'll definitely have to look into that because um asc.gov is the one to go to you just find an appraiser type in your state your zip code and it gives you everything even expireds which is unfortunate but you just hit active and it then your list is fairly short especially if you go by zip code or by county okay you know it would i think the applicant would do wise to at least call a few appraisers and pick some brains before they decide maybe not to use one and at least they understand why they need one because yes. i think most applicants would do would have a better chance at what they want to accomplish if they had an appraisal it may even tell them that they don't need to come in and waste their time here which may be a benefit to everybody understood thank you okay any other comments I have two. Okay. Um, along this same line, a lot of people just really want to be treated fairly, and uh, and sometimes we've had to d dismiss their cases without even hearing them. Uh, to the assessor's office, do you have any problem? You've already pres you already have a paper copy of the appraisal. You don't have to come on down. It's a simple question. You already have a copy of the appraisal. Do you mind if we suggest that you give the applicant the that copy of the appraisal so they know sort of what what they would be up against you know what i'm talking about 
they come in here and they think they can present square footage or you know they've never even seen an appraisal and we say no and they still haven't seen an appraisal so my question is do you have any objection to the board asking you to give the applicant the appraisal after we've turned down the case in other words i'm suggesting if if we say sorry we can't hear the case because you haven't presented any evidence do you mind if the county council ask you to give as a courtesy to give that a copy of your appraisal to to the applicant so that they you've already won the case no understood um no i don't think there would necessarily be any objections to that if um, the board's already made their determination um, i just wanted to add that typically when that happens um, the assessor has spent an extensive amount of time trying to explain to the applicant um, mm -hmm. how they need to present a case to the board and that there need to be comps or a cost approach or you know that it mm -hmm. would need to follow um, typical appraisal procedures and for whatever reason um, you know I think we we still resolve about 95 percent of the cases outside of this boardroom for whatever reason there are still a few people that we're just we're unable to communicate that well with and so that's why they end up at the board with those issues um, but i assure you we have done everything we can to attempt to um, explain to them uh, what would be required thank you i have one question for you miss hill before you step down would you prefer to talk to an appraiser or an applicant as far as the applicant's property is concerned um you know i think it's fine to talk to either one okay um, it's definitely a different conversation that you have with a homeowner versus um, a professional right. applicant um, yeah. it, it is a different conversation and so you do have to approach it a little bit differently there is a lot more emotion involved when you when you speak to homeowners and and that's okay we can get through that right and, um, the and homeowners don't always understand the same concepts that the appraiser does right so that's and where I'm kind of going professionally I mean you know you'll have a better conversation that might net a better outcome with an appraiser versus an applicant well we just started a different point because you know when right. we do talk to a homeowner that may not have any experience in this we do have to start at square one and explain the whole process and so it's just a different starting point really in the conversation but um, I think we're equally successful in, in dealing with both. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm just going to sit up front this time. <laughs> <laughs> Will everybody else follow yeah. you up? Somebody <laughs> just, just, yeah, up. just line up. <laughs> uh, one final question yeah, okay. uh, to the clerk of the board. Uh, we've had a number of meetings where there's like 10, 12 applicants, and we do the time limit, and the ones toward the back of the list. I know they're not going to be heard in the morning. You know, I can just tell by the number. And you do a good job of telling them, okay, it's going to be later on. But I wonder if in some cases we can sort of have a fixed schedule where you tell people uh, not to come. You can come. It, your case won't be heard by until 1 o'clock at least, or you don't have to come back till, till 1 o'clock. That way they're not sitting here all day and then and their, their case is heard at 3 or 4 o'clock. Um, so the one thing that, you know, the hearing schedule is very unpredictable, even with us calling everyone on the agenda the week before, what you, we get as far as feedback doesn't necessarily end up what's panning out. Um, and, and so we've thought about, you know, doing morning session, afternoon session, um, However, we, you know, we have to notice people at what time to appear. So we you know, currently do 9.30 to allow you know, flexibility of moving the schedule around if there's a less complicated case or an emergency uh, or if you know, everyone at the front end of the agenda decides to reschedule. Um, so it's definitely a, a balancing act that uh, you know, we can try to see if there's better uh, methods. Uh, we definitely do offer... If there's a large uh, amount of people in person, uh, we will you know, let them know, hey, it doesn't look like you're going to be heard till after lunch. If you want to give us your phone number, you know, we'll you know, call you 30 minutes beforehand and for you to come back so you don't have to wait here. Um, 
and, and for the most part, that works out. It's just, unfortunately, it's very unpredictable of determining who's mm -hmm. going forward. We send out notices of hearing at least 30 days in advance, um, or sorry, 45 days in advance. Uh, as you see, most people request rescheduling multiple times before we actually end up with a hearing. So we, we kind of just count the initial hearing as a throwaway hearing. We know very few are actually going to move forward on that initial hearing. And then um, it just comes down to, to preparedness. Uh, like we get varying responses of preparedness when we speak to everyone on the phone. We also check in with the assessor and, and try to best estimate what's going to move forward on each hearing day. Uh, it's just very difficult to, to predict um, what's actually going to happen. But we can see if there's better ways to uh, structure the schedule for the day. I was thinking more in terms of when we've gone through and everybody's given their timeline. I, I think you're sometimes hesitant to push the board to say, well, is it okay to, to schedule these people after yeah. one o'clock that you seem hesitant to do that? And I'm, I'm thinking it doesn't bother me if we, if we have a hard deadline for the back five, if you were back four or whatever, so that they won't be here till one o'clock. Okay. So just my own preference. I don't know if the board has any problem with that. So I'm thinking if you have 10 people and we think we're going to hear the first four, we don't know the next three, and then the next you know, next three after that, we're pretty sure we're not going to hear till 1 o'clock that we sort of give yeah, I think Brendan the, the option of saying, okay, is it okay with the board if I, if I, mm -hmm. if I have these people come back at 1 o'clock? Yeah, I do know Brendan does... Uh, he, he does that sometimes, yeah, but I'm thinking yeah, if, he had little, if he was a little bit more yeah. confident that we wouldn't be upset mm -hmm. that if the, he'd do it more often. Mm -hmm. The problem is the time estimates. Inevitably, we will get a 15 to 30 minute. That turns into an no, hour. I, I know. They're so all under. That happens more often than not. So... Um, but yeah, I, I think as we approach like the 11, 1130 time, if you, we have a lot more cases coming up, definitely Brendan does let them know they're probably not going to hear you until after lunch. But uh, maybe as, as chair, we can stop and, and look at the clock at 1130 and readjust that way. So, Well, I was thinking more in terms of, okay, we've, we've heard the list of who's going to present and how much time that... that uh, and give time allocations at the beginning. Yeah, time allocations at the... that you guys in, in charge of the board would have some suggestions that, okay, we're... we're yeah, it's, it's tough because you want to do It's tough because you don't know. You, and court. you theoretically... My thinking, though, is you theoretically they go faster, which they never seem to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just take an early lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, it's a tough one. That's it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments from board members? Okay. Are we ready to circle back to the clerk's presentation? So I'm uh, Brendan Vlahakis, your senior deputy clerk, and I'm here to give you the report on the past year's activities in assessment appeals. Uh, last year we went into a lot of detail because of the amount of new board members. I'm going to go through this a lot quicker this year. Uh, first, time to celebrate. Patricia Little has hit 30 years of service on the assessment appeals board. Oh so congratulations. <laughs> She was first appointed by the Board of Supervisors on June 15, 1993. So thank you for your continued Aww. dedicated service to the board. Thank you. Happy also to do Also celebrating it. Board Member Ferris at 30 years. <laughs> she was first appointed November 16, 1993 by the Board of Supervisors. And so thank you, Board Member Ferris, for your 30 years of service. Where's the cape at? We're getting old. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Board Member, I think you, had a, you were going to say something before I interrupted. No. Sorry. Oh, or, or, no one's going to say? Okay. So just a recap of our board members. So we've, we've had board member Ferris and Little here for 30 years. Board member Sisk is hitting his 10 years on the board this summer. Wow. And thank you to our newly joined board members, Farina, Lunetta, and Cam, at one and a half years of service. 
And as we know, Board Member Cam will be leaving the board at the end of this month. So we thank you for your service on the board. Uh, come November, sorry, September, we should have two new board members in place to fill each of the vacancies on the boards. So real briefly, recapping the clerk of the board organization. So we're division of the county executive office. Um, Savette Johnson is now the county CEO. Last year, she was our interim CEO. Uh, Mike Pettit is our assistant CEO, who is our division head. Uh, Rosa Gonzalez is the, off, uh, the chief deputy clerk of the board overseeing our office. And then you have our clerk of the board division staff. Uh, so the clerk board team, uh, we have Mia Martinez, who's sitting here in front of you uh, in the seat opposite of I, myself, uh, we have Lori Key and Anna Hall, and then we've brought in Barbara Meyer from, uh, she's extra help, retired from the assessor's office. She's helping us uh, with some of our backlog because we do currently have three um, unfilled staffing positions. Uh, so you know, we had a new clerk last year who um, has moved on to another position, and um, are, we've just had um, taking some time getting our vacancies filled. We're hoping this summer uh, we'll get fully staffed up and be better to, able to respond, uh, because it's definitely been hitting assessment appeals hard when three of our seven positions uh, do not have anybody there. So we're uh, working and it's been great having Barbara there the last few weeks. She's really helping us. Uh, she's got a lot of experience in how assessments operate, having worked in the assessor's office. So she's helping us get caught up on the backlog along with the rest of our clerk of the board staff. Uh, Lori and Anna on our team do not do assessment appeals as their day-to-day -day work and they've dug in and helped us uh, to address our backlogs and try to get things moving. So here's a real quick picture <laughs> of our staff. We've got Anna, Lori, myself, Barbara, and Mia, just so you all know what we look like. <laughs> so what we do, we, we provide assistance to applicants with filing their applications and the hearing procedures. We support your boards and the hearing officer. And we work collaboratively with the assessor's office and other county agencies to provide public service. Um, again, we don't only do assessment appeals. We are direct staff to seven boards and commissions. We uh, support the Board of Supervisors meetings. We do hybrid meeting attendance support at all of our board and commission meetings. Uh, we're responsible for Form 700, Statement of Economic Interest Tracking. Uh, we track appointees to over 100 county board and commissions. Uh, we manage training for all those boards and commissions. We handle public inquiries, and we have special projects that we're managing, one of which we're going to give you a little more information on today. Uh, so our accomplishments uh, for the past year, they mainly pertain to our online assessment appeal system, which we've been expanding over the last few years. Um, public access enhancements. We've now given uh, applicants to view documents associated with their appeals online in their portal. And I'm going to give you a demonstration of all this at the end. Um, applicants can now filter and search for all applications they have on file with us in our electronic system. Uh, they can know their application status, disposition, and hearing date, all within our online portal without having to call the clerk of the board's office. Um, within the next few weeks, we're going to be launching an e-signature withdrawal system. Uh, many people don't have printers, scanners anymore, and so when they want to cancel their application, uh, right now we send them a form to sign, print out, and scan back to us or mail back to us. Uh, in the next few weeks, this will be changing where they'll be able to um, withdraw directly from their online portal um, without having to involve any paper. And then uh, further narrowing down the amount of paper used and ease for taxpayers, then the next year we're going to be launching an online postponement system where the taxpayers and applicants can directly select a new hearing when eligible from their online portal. They're going to be able to submit their hearing confirmations online. And we're hoping by the end of the calendar year to uh, bring stipulations into the e-signature realm so that there's no such thing as a preliminary or facsimile signed stipulation. And we can just do them all on the internet. So uh, that is things uh, coming in the next year. So the statistics. Uh, appeal filings this past year did go up slightly from the prior year although generally holding in that 1,500 uh, appeal category that we've seen the last several years. Uh, 
get re regular appeals were about the same and the jump was manually attributed to supplemental escape assessment and role changes. Uh, a lot of that we're seeing is due to the rollout of Proposition 19 and the changes in the law and the additional appeals being filed to challenge uh, those outcomes uh, due to the additional state restrictions. Uh, so as your board knows, hearings went up significantly this past year, mainly attributed to special hearings. And the hearing officer actually went down the past year. We went from four hearings to three. Um, just less people are applying to go to the hearing officer uh, format. Appeal resolution times. Um, so uh, the, these are by fiscal year. So in the past year, the board resolved just over or just under 1,200 appeals. That's about on average. Um, that accounts for we had started out the year uh, with still remote meetings. Um, it was transitioning in, and it's uh, there's just a lot of old cases. So the average resolution times are up because we're finally resolving those really old cases that had been on hold for numerous years. Um, but in general, we're, we're pretty happy with the results. Uh, in general, 12 months to resolve an application, 13 months before your board, sticking with nine months for the hearing officer and residential property. And then on average, non-residential property has gone up. Again, that's attributed to the cases that had been on hold due to COVID-19. Those required more in-person hearings. And so those are up to an average of 15 months. So we're hoping by this time next year, we'll see these numbers go back down to the pre-pandemic levels where we're seeing speedy resolution across the board uh, for all appeal applications. Uh, this is a new slide. Uh, we wanted to put together a percentage slide, a lot of numbers here. Uh, basically, this is saying, as Ms. Hill mentioned previously, over 95% of appeals filed are resolved before, or not necessarily before they come to your board, but without a hearing before your board. So uh, over 50% is uh, withdrawn, meaning they filed and decided not to pursue it. And then around 30% is stipulated with the assessor. So that is you know, putting us at less than 5% applications actually going before your board. And it's pretty evenly split between uh, sustaining the assessor's determination or reducing it at about 2 to 3% on average of cases filed that move forward. But that's just showing you, you know, all the work going on behind the scenes with the assessor's office, the taxpayers and applicants, and the clerk of the board's office working to resolve over 55% of the appeals filed each year. So uh, metrics the clerk of the board's office directly controls. Again, this is mainly reflective of, of our uh, changes in staffing. Uh, we've improved the days after the application is filed that it's provided to the assessor. On average, it's 111 days over the past year. Uh, so we receive the application, we review it, we fix uh, deficiencies with it, and then it's forwarded to the assessor's office. We're doing that on an average 111 days. Uh, after the application is filed, how long they receive hearing notice. So this is the lag time between when we get the application and when it's set for that first hearing. Uh, so we are slightly up at 162. Uh, we're hoping again over the next year to bring that number down and get things scheduled for hearing faster. And the last is, is how, off, how in advance we give taxpayers notice of their hearing. So by law, we have to give at least 45 days so anything above that is additional notice. Um, and we're just right around 55 still, been the last few years. Uh, our goal is to hit around 75 days advance notice for our office so that we're giving uh, taxpayers you know, almost double the amount of notice required by law. Um, so we'll continue to work on improving these metrics. And so next, I'm going to give you a, a brief demonstration of our online appeal system, unless there's any questions about the statistics mm -hmm. at this point. Okay. Good job. All right, so as I mentioned, we've spent a significant amount of time over the past year um, improving public access to our uh, assessment appeals. And this is one of the many special projects our office is working on. Um, 
So um, this is linked, our online assessment appeal application, and I, I will be giving you uh, demonstration data today. This is not real data. This is our test system. So some things may look a little funky, just a disclosure there. Um, this is linked from our main website, but also taxpayers can go directly here to begin filing. It's ventura.org forward slash OAA, which stands for Online Appeal Application. Um, and so uh, part of the law that allows us to do e-signatures is that we verify that the uh, person signing is real. So we do have a quick registration process where they put in their email address and then they have to click on a link in their email to verify they have access to that so that we have guaranteed communication going forward. Once someone creates their account, they can go ahead and sign in at any time. Excuse me. And I'll just, uh, so they have um, applications in process that they can work on, and then applications filed. Um, I took some, a few tax agents that I knew had a lot of appeals and, and just assigned those to myself so we can see them for demonstration purposes. So first I'm just going to walk everyone through an online appeal. So they can click to start a new one, or if they say file the same thing every year, they can actually copy their appeal from a prior year and just start filing that uh, without having to do all the work over. This is also helpful for people that um, say have a property with multiple locations. It allows them to, um, to quickly file. Our goal here is to encourage electronic filing as many, um, particularly with professional tax agents, use mail merge software and it's sometimes more efficient for them to file in paper. And so we're trying to make our online system as efficient as possible so that um, we can um, encourage online filing. Um, so once a taxpayer or applicant is in the system, they can search for their property if they have the parcel number. If they don't know their parcel number, um, they can also search by their address. Once they have their property, they can go ahead and select it and proceed with the appeal. Um, we have various instructions, but we basically take them through step by step of the process. So I can go ahead and file a regular appeal, which is the most common type of appeal. And then it's going to ask for an assessment. So they do have to put in an amount. Uh, we'll go ahead and put in a dollar. And that will pull over um, this. Uh, the, the value on roll, uh, we often get confused, so this is pulled in directly from the assessor's database annually so that we are um, ensuring accurate filing of the assessment being appealed and also so our staff has some verification. If we see a disparity in the numbers, we know maybe there was some misunderstanding with the application being filed. Um, so we do compare directly to the assessor's data. Um, they can then uh, select, so if they filed appeals before, their information will just show up and they can go ahead and select that. Um, if they um, have multiple names they filed on, it'll all be there as well. And an applicant just can fill out their information. If someone chooses to be uh, professionally represented, they can select their representative uh, from this list, or if they are going to be self-represented, they can go ahead and leave it blank. Now, the reason for filing, your board sees a lot of amendments. Although we have electronic filing, this uh, section six of the appeal, the facts and reasons, continues to be the biggest area of confusion. We do have a demonstration of video, and if um, an applicant calls us to understand these questions better, we will walk them through it. Uh, but these questions are required uh, and language designed by the state board without us being permitted to modify it. So there does continue to be questions and confusion on section six. Uh, we're hoping to find ways to improve that over the coming year. Uh, so they can select their reason for appeal. Uh, most applicable is going to be a decline in value appeal, which your board sees, although we have been seeing more change in ownership appeals as of recently. Then it's just going to ask them to complete the remaining questions um, as required by law on how they'd like their appeal to proceed, being if they want findings of fact or not, if they want to designate their application as a claim for refund, and the type of hearing that they are selecting. Again, walking through the, the legally required questions. Um, 
So um, when we get to signature, someone can either e-sign or if they have trouble e-signing, they can also create a computer-generated signature. Uh, and it allows them to save it if they have multiple filings they want to complete so that we do not have to have them uh, recreate a signature each time. It will save it in their profile for them. Uh, if someone chooses, they can review the application to verify everything is correct. But also if someone goes ahead and uh, submits the application, um, it'll immediately be loaded into our system and they will immediately get a confirmation email that's been received. So no need to worry if the post office lost your application or not. We have immediate confirmation that it's been received. Um, so real quickly, so submitted applications, an applicant can view them in their uh, table below. Um, they can filter further if they need to um, to determine what applications are open or closed. Um, they can see right when their hearing date is in case they forgot. And they can also have a, they have a status available so we can let them know if it's good for hearing and if they've come from their appearance or not or if they haven't responded. And if they hover, it'll give them a little bit more of a description of the necessary action. In the coming months, there are going to be additional selections added to where uh, withdrawal and postponement will be possible. And again, that's expected by the end of this month. Uh, so real quickly, uh, so once someone's filed, they can go in and see their filing information. Uh, any files that we have associated with them, they can go ahead and view. They can view their application, anything they attached, and also get a copy of their hearing notice in case they lost it. And again, as the appeal goes on, Additional documents are loaded here, so if, uh, say, it's post-hearing, they're hearing evidence, and the board decision will also be posted here, allowing access at any time um, so that they do not need to call or email the clerk of the board to get this. It's really intended to be self-service, um, anytime access, and it'll also let the applicants know when their case is closed, um, should they not remember if it's closed or if they're not sure if we received their stipulation or withdrawal, they can go ahead and see uh, the status of it was closed and how it was closed. Uh, so that completes my demonstration and my presentation and I'm available for any questions if the board has any. Well, thank you. <clears throat> that was impressive. Any questions, comments from the board? Is the online available now? Yes, so we've been offering online appeal filing since 2020. Um, and so what I showed you today is all available now. And then just every few weeks, we add new features. Um, so this past year, the filtering and status lookup was added. Um, and hearing date, document access were added this year. And then in the coming months, so we'll be launching electronic withdrawal in the next few months. And as soon as that becomes available, it will be pushed as an update. Um, so we're just continuously updating the, the public system. Cool. Uh, Brendan? Yes. Uh, on transfers, there's both the supplemental and there's the regular role. Of course, they have uh, different dates that you have to apply by. Uh, how is that handled by the system? Yeah, so right now it's on. Uh, the, the system doesn't determine if an appeal is timely or not. Uh, the clerk of the board staff still reviews everything that comes through um, to verify um, accuracy. Um, so the supplemental, for example, changing ownership must be appealed within 60 days. If someone chooses to appeal a supplemental, um, they're required by law to provide a copy of the letter they're appealing um, from the assessor. And that... Um, then gets uploaded. And so then our staff, as part of our verification process, ensures it's within 60 days of that. Now, we will often, as your board sees, uh, someone maybe file regular and not um, providing a supplemental or not realizing they had appeal rights. Um, there's not much we can do about that because if, if, if they don't provide the information, we don't know they had the right to appeal it. Um, but in general, we do at least everything that was filed. We verify it was uh, the applicant was eligible for what they filed upon, and if they are not, we um, work with them to correct it. Uh, let's say the 60 days is over. Yes. Okay. So they can't file on their supplemental, but they can file on their regular on their 601. Yes. Um, what does the system tell the applicant? Anything? 
The system does not, so when, if, say we were to receive a late supplemental appeal, we would send a letter that says, you missed your 60 days, but you can file between July 2nd and September 15th for the current year. So we would send a letter. Uh, the, the system does not make determinations if applications are timely filed or not. There's varying uh, late file deadlines as well, depending on information provided by the taxpayer. So it's in general, it's a, a direct calculation based on their assessment, but um, oftentimes there's exceptions as well. And so we have to examine each of those unique situations and determine who's eligible to move forward or not. Um, and if there's any ever a disagreement between the clerk and the applicant wishing to apply, we then bring it to your board for a validity hearing through your board to make that determination if it should be accepted or not. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from the board? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Where are we now, Brandon? Are we... 13. Okay. Are we going to hear a case now? Or are we going to adjourn uh, the yeah, uh, So uh, county, on item 13, county council is just going to give a brief overview. Okay. So um, it'll just be a, a few minutes. Okay. Uh, so this will be for board time. members Sisk, Farino, and Ferris to hear the uh, information from county council. OK. Can so, we do a f oh. I was going to request five minute break. OK. We had a request for five minute recess. OK. OK, we'll adjourn back at um, 1050. Okay. There's only a half left. <laughs> or that's all you.
back on the record okay are we all set here is anyone she's not yet yeah, not quite there we, we're good okay well emily she's got a mouthful oh sorry, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she needs another 30 seconds <laughs> um do we need um, a session office to be here for this or no okay no we're good okay all right, this is um, just to give your board an update on an appeal that had been working its way through the court system I uh, actually reported on this case last annual meeting, um, and there's been some further developments since then. Um, to refresh your recollection, this is the Air 7 case, and the appeal relates to the situs of a 2008 Gulfstream G550 aircraft that's owned by Air 7 LLC. The appeal has to do with um, the situs as of the January 1, 2017 lien date. Air 7 is headquartered in Camarillo, Air 7 had been attempting to sell the subject aircraft since about 2015. In 2016, the aircraft was hangered at the Camarillo Airport between flights. And in 2016, the aircraft spent at least seven and a half months in Ventura County. On December 26, 2016, Air 7 moved the aircraft to a hangar in Oregon, where Air 7's advertising manager and sales office were located. As a result, on the January 1, 2017 lien date, the aircraft was not physically present in Ventura County. The aircraft was subsequently sold and never returned to Ventura County. The assessor determined that the tax situs of the aircraft remained in Ventura County, even though the aircraft was not physically present on the lien date. The assessor assessed the aircraft at a value of over $22 million. Air 7 appealed the assessment to the Assessment Appeals Board, the board determined that the aircraft had situs in Ventura County as of the lien date and did not have situs in Oregon, and therefore taxes were properly levied by the County of Ventura. Air 7 then appealed the board's ruling to the Superior Court, seeking a refund of the taxes that they paid in an amount over $200,000. The Superior Court, and this is what I reported on last year at this time, the Superior Court agreed with the board and found that the aircraft is not required to be physically present in the county on the lien date. The question is whether there is a sufficient degree of permanence relating to the location to, uh, to establish tax situs. Uh, the Superior Court agreed with the assessor that the aircraft had not been permanently removed from the county as of the lien date. And prop because they determined that property is not permanently removed from a jurisdiction unless situs is uh, established elsewhere. And because situs had not been established in Oregon, they said that the situs remains in Ventura County. Um, Air 7 appealed the Superior Court's ruling. And so it went to the Court of Appeal. And at the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal agreed with the taxpayer, overruling both the Superior Court and the board. 
The Court of Appeal held that because the aircraft was removed from California with the intent that the removal be permanent, and because the aircraft never returned to California during the 2017 tax year, the aircraft was not situated or habitually situated in California. The court added that it does not matter whether the aircraft was situated and taxed in another state. The Court of Appeal ordered a refund of taxes, statutory entry, interest, and the penalties imposed. Issuing the refund does not require board action. As such, this item was agendized for informational purposes only and for your board to receive and file. Okay, thank you. Um, does the board just, have any comments or questions? That's or? just for board number yeah. one, correct? Yeah, technically board one had heard that, uh, but if okay. any of the board members have questions, you're, you're free to ask county council. Okay, are there any questions? Anybody remember? Okay, looking for a motion. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, does it say how um, the Court of Appeal determined um, the intent? It said if they determined that the, there was, the intent was to permanently remove it from Ventura County. It appeared that it was based on statements made by the applicant's representatives about it was their intent, that they were, it was their intention to sell the aircraft, as it was their intention to move it to Oregon. They were not intending it. So it appears it was based on the applicant's statements. Okay, thanks. Okay, looking for a motion to receive and file. So moved. I didn't think we had, I thought this was information only. We well, I think we have to approve it, right? Receive and file is essentially just just saying the information's okay. been received. So if okay. yeah, if that motion is is okay. Okay. If we had the second to that, yes. I had a, a motion by Member Ferris. Who uh, second? second? Okay, thank you. And there's no objections to that motion. Thank you. All right. Excellent. So if the board would like to take a, a brief recess, uh, board members. Uh, Lunetta, Little, and Sisk will be staying to hear a, a special hearing, and then the other board members uh, can go. No longer need to stay. We are expecting a, several hours for the next hearing, and uh, so we can take a brief recess to set up for that if that's all right with the board. Okay, that's fine. How long do we need? Like ten minutes, uh, fifteen minutes? Less than ten minutes. Yeah, five, five, ten. ten okay. We can say ten minutes. Started. Uh, okay, so we'll readjourn at eleven o five. Thank you.
All right, Chair Lunetta, we're back on the record. We're at items 14 through 17. Thank you, Brendan. Um, okay, we're hearing application number 19-11434 to 19-11437, Royal Pacific International, Inc. Thank you, Chair Lunetta. And I'd like to start by placing the parties under oath today before we begin receiving testimony. If the assessor's representatives and the applicant will please stand and raise your right arm. When I complete reading your oath, please state I do. In each of you to solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give and the matters now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. You may now be seated. Chair Lunetta, this is a uh, part two of a, a 2019 application originally heard um, in June 2020. At that first part of the hearing, the board, which consisted of board member Crow, Little, and Sisk, Assessment Appeals Board number two, determined that there was a 20% change in ownership on January 8th, 2019. Um, there's uh, the exhibits from that hearing are in the binders ahead of you. That's applicant's exhibit number one, consisting of 615 pages of documents related to the subject property. So that is from the prior hearing. Um, in, from June, June 29th, 2020. Um, and so that's exhibit one from the prior hearing. We've also provided copies of the application. Uh, again, this is the, today's hearing, and we'll hear more of an overview from the assessor, is to, to, to determine a market value for the subject property as of January 8th, 2019. Um, assessor's exhibit A has, has been submitted. Uh, let's see, A and B have been submitted to the board for review. And uh, one last thing before we turn over to the assessor, uh, Mr. San Agustin, just to confirm, you indicated you will request written findings of fact, is that correct? Okay, and so um, I have advised Mr. San Agustin that payment of $150 will be required before uh, the end of this business day, uh, and, and so he indicated that would be provided. Uh, so with that, we can turn it over to the assessor if you'd like an overview or for them to just get into the, the case, Chair Lunetta. Yes, I'd like the overview from the assessor. Oh, and then we, we want to confirm, it's, it's the assessor, does the assessor carry the burden of proof? Uh, yes, our understanding is it does. This one, we did have to issue a raise letter for this property. And my understanding is when a raise letter is issued, then the burden shifts to us. Um, so. Okay. Sorry, Thank one you. more thing for County Council. I think there's a procedural requirement for the raise, or maybe that's after the assessor presents. I'm just trying to recall the last time. Do we have to have an acknowledgement by the board? Um, sorry, I, I didn't think about that. We can, we can take care of it after the assessor. You're right, I'll figure out what it is. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so today we're discussing um, a vacant industrial piece of land in Oxnard. It's near Perkins Road in Oxnard, which is pretty much at the southern tip of Oxnard. Um, the applicant has appealed the supplemental assessment for the change of ownership on January 8th, 2019. Um, and I think I'll, as part of the overview and my presentation, I'll, I think I'll just kind of jump into everything, uh, if yeah, that makes that, sense. That sounds good. Thanks. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start on page two. Here is some tables summarizing uh, the values. Um, so as of January 8th, 2019, you see all the enrolled values, and then you'll see the slight increases. Um, that's due to factoring, and I'll kind of describe in detail why we're seeing that now, why we're seeing that little raise in factoring. Um, and then at the bottom there is a value summary table. I wanted to explain that a little bit for you. So the first two columns you see there are, you have the original May 8th, 2019 valuation, and then that got changed to January 8th, 2019 valuation. So you'll see the two valuation dates, our value has remained the same. Um, and then the next two columns, you have your new supplemental value for 
as well as 1920 in the next column. And you'll see one of them's 4 million. The next is 4,064 due to some factoring. And then the final column is basically for informational purposes. This is not part of what is being appealed today, but it is part of the value of the property. Mm -hmm. So this is this will be the established base year value of the property for the 2020-2021 roll year. Um, again, this is just for informational purposes, just to show uh, kind of where it'll land uh, based on the assessor's valuation. So the $4,145,278. Um, again, that's not what the board will be deciding today, but that is kind of where it'll lead. Just wanted to show that as well. All right, so let's start on page three. As I said, this is an appeal of the supplemental assessment for the change of ownership on January 8th, 2019. Um, and I wanted to go into a description of the subject. So the subject is vacant land located near Perkins Road in Oxnard. Uh, it's in close proximity to the beach. Uh, the subject is adjacent to a drainage canal. And according to the city of Oxnard, the subject zoning is coastal development industry. And the city of Oxnard describes the subject zoning as the following. I basically copied and pasted this from the city website. Uh, basically, the purpose of CDI subzone is to provide areas for those types of energy and industrial activities that require location adjacent to or in the vicinity of the sea to function. The intent of this subzone is to assure that energy and industrial land uses will neither generate environmental degradation nor otherwise adversely affect public welfare. Uh, and there's a little more descriptions there. Basically, this land is zoned for property that produces energy and needs the sea to function. Mm. That's what it's currently zoned for. And that's my understanding from their website. Um, going on to the next paragraph, the subject has unique contamination issues. The subject is referred to as the active Halico Superfund site. Um, so for the change in ownership on January 8th, 2019, the EPA who is in charge of the cleanup of this site, um, it stated on the website that it has been stabilized and secured and they are investigating cleanup options. Testing is underway for one promising option using waste and ready mix concrete. So as of January 8th, 2019, we know the status is basically, um, there's been no cleanup yet of the property. So it is con still contaminated as of the transfer date. Mm -hmm. um, so here's some history on the subject. Uh, originally, the assessor determined a change in ownership occurred on May 8th, 2019. No sales price was reported for the change in ownership. The assessor originally determined this was a 100% change in ownership. Uh, the assessor performed an appraisal and determined the fair market value to be 4 million as of May 8, 2019. This value was enrolled pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code section 75.10A. On June 29, 2020, this application came before the Assessment Appeals Board. The discussion that day was only about the details of whether a change in ownership occurred. Uh, the board found that the change of an ownership was a 20% change in ownership, not a 100% change in ownership. And the date was January 8th, 2019, not May 8th, 2019. And during the hearing, both the applicant and the assessor were in agreement with these facts. So all parties agreed with um, the details of the change of ownership. Um, so prior to the January 8, 2019 change in ownership, the subject was listed for sale for 15 million. The listing was withdrawn in February of 2018. Uh, the, listed, the listing stated uh, it has 40 feet, it has a 40 foot hill contamination of minerals, aluminum, gold, silver, copper, magnesium, nickel, palladium, platinum, titanium, just to mention a few, which is worth over 1 billion uh, once it's purified and refined. To refine the cost is between 20 to 40 million. And this list listing was unsuccessful. It did not sell. sell. All right. Next page, I'm gonna move into a description about the valuation. 
So for this property, the assessor used the comparable sales method to determine the fair market value for the subject property. Uh, the assessor originally determined the fair market value to be four million. Since the change in ownership was determined to be January 8, 2019 instead of May 8, 2019, the assessor reviewed our value conclusion again and, and determined the fair market value remained the same. The subject previously changed ownership on December 8, 2019, so about two years prior. This change in ownership had a purchase price of four million. The purchase price was accepted as fair market value and enrolled pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code Section 110. So just a little history there. On December 8, 2017, purchased for $4 million and the assessor had accepted that sales price at that time. So next paragraph, since the subject is determined to be a 20% change in ownership as of January 8, 2019, the new base year value is a blended value. Uh, it's what we refer to as a partial interest transfer. Mm. The blended value is 20% of the value established for January 8, 2019 and 80% of the value established for December 8th, 2017 with appropriate Prop 13 factoring. So basically 80% of the property is maintaining its Prop 13 value and 20% is getting a new Prop 13 value. That's how it boils down. Um, so I have the, I showed you the value summary table located on page two of this exhibit. Um, as well as we are going to touch on the partial interest transfer worksheets for the details of how these are calculated. Um, so the value for January 8, 2019 was determined to be the same as the value for December 8, 2017 at 4 million. Based on the information provided by the applicant, the applicant's opinion is the value of the subject is much higher than the assessor's value conclusion. So today we're kind of it seems like we're sitting in different chairs today because the assessor will be advocating for a lower value <laughs> and it's our understanding the applicant will be advocating for a much higher value. So this is somewhat unique for us, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'll continue here. Um, in support of the applicant's opinion of value, the applicant provided an appraisal. The data value on the appraisal was April 28, 2018. So it's relatively somewhat close to our lien date, maybe almost a year old, but um, it had a value conclusion of 72,500,000. Uh, the appraisal states the subject has been valued as free of any hazardous subs substances on the appraised date. The appraisal goes on to appraise the property with the highest and best use of mixed use commercial, retail, and residential. The appraisal also states access appears to be average. The comparable sales utilized were all purchased to develop into residential or mixed residential projects. And the only exception was one comp uh, was developed into an industrial park. Uh, the reason I mentioned this is this appraisal was included in the applicant's exhibit back in 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is there, I'll be, that's the one I'll be referencing um, for this. So the assessor disagrees with this appraisal for a few reasons. Uh, the subject property must be valued in its current state as of January 8, 2019. So we don't have the liberty to assume no hazardous materials on the property. That's according to property, property tax laws, we, we can't make that assumption okay. on the property. Um, so this means the contamination on the property cannot be ignored. The applicant's appraisal also seems to ignore the zoning restrictions of the subject property. Under current zoning, the subject cannot be built into a mixed use commercial, retail, or residential property. Uh, this renders most of the comparable sales selected as invalid. The final comparable sale in the appraisal that might be comparable to the subject is located in Newberry Park. And the appraiser, in our opinion, incorrectly concludes that this comparable is considered inferior to our subject property. Um, so those are a few reasons why we were not in agreement with the appraisal that was submitted in the applicant's exhibit. Um, all right, so moving on, here's a photo of our subject. You'll see along the left-hand side, that's the canal I was talking about. 
-hmm. that leads to the ocean there. It's surrounded mostly by vacant land towards the north tip there. That's, a, I believe, an industrial site kind of at the very end of South Oxnard. So um, the subject property is in a very undeveloped location mm -hmm. with not much around it at all. Um, also, there appears to be some sort of, I'm not sure about the access of the property, uh, that road there ends on the far top right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was unable to determine if the subject has an easement through the other parcels to, in order to get access. I was unfortunately unable to find that information out. So there are some questions of access to the property. Not really, I wasn't able to find an answer for that. Um, okay, so the next page, page six, this is my appraisal. Um, just briefly, the first sale there is the subject property that sold in December 8, 2017 for four million. Based on the uniqueness of this property and the contaminants and everything, that sale in 2017 is our best indicator of value um, for our January 8, 2019. Um, it was determined that was a market value sale, fair market value sale. And so that's our best indicator. We have two supporting comps here. They are, they seem to bracket the sale of 4 million. And they're a bit more recent, closer in time to our, um, our sales date. So for these reasons, after adjustment, we did conclude the 4 million. And there's a little explanation there, but it's, basically the same as what I've, what's already been stated. All right, so I'm gonna move on now to our next page. This is an overview picture of comparable sale number two. And then comparable sale number three. You'll see that comparable sale number three is used for some storage for the one of the adjacent parcels. Um, and some adjustments were made. <clears throat> uh, let me see here. To that parcel specifically. Um, the next few pages, it's gonna be the next four pages. This is, each parcel has their own allocated value. These are our partial interest worksheets. These are a little bit complicated, but I want to try to explain it as best I can here. So you'll notice, for instance, I'm on page nine. We have the top there represents the 20% change in ownership. The bottom there represents the 80% of the, um, the value determined as of December 8, 2017. So that's how we make sure we're keeping the prop 13 value of the existing 80%. Mm -hmm. So then the next column, you'll see at the very top, it says ST34, and then in parentheses, it's a, it says current year supplemented 1819. So this is telling us the values we're going to enter for the 1819 supplemental year. You'll see the top represents 20% of the total value 212,900, 80% of that value, 851,600. Then the next year, 1920, because the property, that 80% was in 2017, it does get factored for that year. So this is where we apply a 2% Prop 13 factor to that value specifically. The 20% change in ownership does not get a factor for that supplemental. Then the next um, says values for open roll 2021. Again, this would be informational purposes for our appeal, but you'll see both the subject, or I'm, I'm sorry, both the 20% and the 80% both get another 2% factor based on proper Prop 13 factoring. Um, so this is the whole reason for our increase in our raise letter. Because originally, 
we had a hundred percent change of ownership at four million. So the property in effect went down in value slightly because it lost that factoring. Now that we've changed it to a 20% change in ownership, that 80% is going to keep its factoring mm -hmm. and therefore it's going to get a slight raise than what was originally enrolled. Um, so that's why we're seeing that raise in value there. It's simply because of the 80% factoring. Right. Um, we're not suggesting the value, actually our conclusion is the 4 million is the same, simply the factoring is what causes that raise in value. Um, so that's a brief overview of those four pages. And let me double check this here. Okay, so the next page here, page 13. This is simply from the EPA website. I wanted to show kind of where we got our information from. So this is for informational purposes, but just showing, you know, the status of the subject property as of the change in ownership. So this is here for reference if, uh, if anyone needs to see where I'm getting that information. Okay, so that concludes Exhibit A. I wanna turn now to Exhibit B. So Exhibit B is simply the raise letter that we sent to the applicant uh, back in, I believe it was May, I think I have the date on here, yeah. So May 10th, 2023, we sent this raise letter. It describes basically everything I just tried to describe to you. If you turn to, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't put page numbers on here, but it's uh, basically the third page, the value summary spreadsheet. This is essentially the same spreadsheet in my exhibit A, but it has just slightly more details showing old values versus new values and the percent change. Um, so I thought that might be also a good reference for the board if they wanted to look at it in a little bit more detail. For instance, you'll see the only thing changing where it says original supplemental for 1920, new supplemental 1920, that's where you see that difference because of factoring. Mm -hmm. And then again, for informational purposes, the new base year is the last two columns showing the difference. Again, that's informational. Um, next page is the same exact uh, sales grid that I had in my exhibit A, there should be no changes there, as well as the partial interest trans uh, worksheets that I had in my exhibit A. So these are all repeating, I just wanted to show exactly what was sent to the applicant for the raise letter. Um, so with that, Uh, so the assessor's appraisal indicates a fair market value of $4 million for the change in ownership on January 8, 2019. The sale of the subject property on December 8, 2017 for $4 million is our best indicator of value for the subject property. Uh, the assessor requests the Assessment Appeals Board enroll the values outlined in the value summary table on page two of this exhibit. Um, and that will conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Um, Brendan, uh, is do I do we then um, turn to the applicant for yes. questions? Sorry, yes. So at this point, uh, it would uh, be time for questioning specifically related to the assessor's presentation. First from the taxpayer, and then from the board. So we would turn to Mr. San Augustine to see if he has any questions about what was just presented. And if we don't mind, can we handle the administrative oh, matter yes. um, before the applicant gets to question? And it is just um, under property tax rule 313, when the assessor is requesting a raise, the chair needs to determine whether or not the assessor gave notice in writing to the applicant um, 10 days prior to the hearing. And Mr. Phillips did provide us with yes. this raise letter that's right. dated May 10th. 2023, which is more than 10 days before this hearing. Yes. And so I just um, put it to you, the chair, to make the determination about whether the <laughs> assessor has satisfied uh, that burden. Yes, I, that seems clear evidence that it was uh, provided 10 days prior. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, Mr. San Augustine, do you have questions for the assessor? 
Yes, I do. <clears throat> uh, I noticed um, in uh, Accessors Exhibit A on page uh, three, um, it says that you have subject's description. My question is, why isn't the legal description in in this report also and reporting to the board? Um, the assessor doesn't typically include a legal description. Uh, typically, our our parcel numbers are enough to identify the property. My statement to that answer is, and the reason. Sec oh, questions only. Oh, oh questions, questions only. only. Okay. Um, would the ex, uh, tax assessor, or would you, as the appraiser, uh, take into account the entire legal description to come up with a uh, basis of value? Uh, we are we are addressing the the properties that have been appealed today. So the parcels that are indicated on the applications are what we're prepared to discuss. Were these parcels, um, when were these parcels uh, assigned parcel numbers? What years? I have no idea that, I, I don't believe that has anything to do with our valuation. Um, in, on page, uh, five, you show a photo of, uh, you show a photo and you, you, uh, said that what I understood that there was no access to this property that you could validate. Is that correct? All right. To clarify, I just don't see a road leading to it. There's this little dirt path, which I assume is uh, perhaps an easement, but I was unable to verify if there's an easement through the adjacent property. But there's a, there's an a what we would consider a typical road that leads to the property you would be able to get that information from the legal description, is, is that correct? If there's a road to it? Correct. Um, perhaps, I'm, I'm not, I, it's not a normal practice of mine to review legal descriptions. As a appraiser, uh, do you use the legal description in your appraisals? Yes or no? No. Are legal descriptions part of the valuation? So legal, so we have a department in our office. It's our property transfer department. They review the deeds, they re review the legal descriptions. By the time it gets to me, that's already been re reviewed and completed. Uh, I'm just an appraiser, I deal with the valuation. I assume their work is correct. Uh, I just typically deal with parcel numbers because that's what our office is used to dealing with is parcel numbers themselves. So the information that you're displaying in both exhibit A and B is an assumption and not quite all the facts, it's correct? Based, it's based on our parcel numbers and based on our property transfer divisions. Um, they're the ones in charge of drawing our parcel maps, assigning parcel numbers. I'm assuming that part of our office uh, sufficiently did their work. And what if you're assuming is wrong? 
that does that is, change the valuation? That's outside the scope of my work. Okay. You mentioned that in uh, your presentation to the board that um, you did this work. I understand and understanding that this is a team of people doing this work. Is that correct? Yes, we operate as a team, but I was the assigned appraiser that I guess did most of the I don't know, grunt work, I guess. I don't know how to put it. But yes, we rely on one another to put out a finished product. It goes under review by my supervisor um, and that sort of thing. Did you use any information uh, after November 31st, 2021? Any information? I'm not aware of any new information or revelations after that time. I conducted my own research and found that these were the three comparable comps were most relevant to our subject. So these comps are, is information from the tax assessor after November 31st, 2021, is that correct? Yes, it's, um, I reviewed these. These are the comps I felt were most applicable to our subject property. In page, on page six, you used a reference um, The subject is an active Halico Superfund site. That's an incorrect statement. Per EPA um, website, the site has been stabilized and secure as of 1 8, 2019. Investing, investigating cleanup options. Testing is underway for one promising option using waste as ready mix concrete. Comp one is subject's prior sale, which is best indicator of value due to its unique contamination issues. The information that you used was from the EPA website, is that correct? Yes. Did you know that there are various information facts that are not displayed on the EPA website? I'm, I'm not an expert on the EPA website. I was just going off of what they, they showed on there. So as an appraiser representing yourself uh, you're saying that you're not an expert? Not on the EPA website. And you included this information in the appraisal, is that correct? Yes. I simply gathered what they're reporting on their website. You're reporting on page 13 that the EPA installed new fencing around Perkins Road property in July 2018. That's not on the EPA website. Is that correct? Um. It says, this is taken directly from EPA. I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure what you mean. If you see the top, it says, it says where it's coming from. How could engineering company, super fun side profile, super fun information, US EPA. At the bottom, it says the website, epa.gov. No, this isn't my information. This is your information. It says that the EPA installed new fencing around Perkins Road, around the Perkins Road property in July 2018. Yeah, I'm, I'm answering your question. At the very bottom, it says it shows the website in epa.gov. So it's showing it's coming from the EPA website. And that new fencing is around my property, correct? On July 2018? It says around the Perkins Road property in 2018. I'm assuming that's yours unless they're referencing something else. In an earlier question, I asked you if my property had access and you said it didn't appear to be, as I understand, or no? I said I wasn't sure. I, uh, my conclusion was basically inconclusive. I was basing that off of the aerial photo that I was looking at. Did you walk the land? No. Is this a EPA opening page that you submitted as part of your information representing this to the board and myself? The opening page? I'm not sure what you mean. When you go to the website, there's an opening page, the home page. Is this the home page? No. The home page of the EPA website? May I interject? Um, this is your opportunity to ask questions of their presentation, not talk about the EPA website or cover pages, specifically about what they presented. Thank you. Moving forward in valuation, I've received the board and myself, we have received information regarding the EPA connected directly to the valuation of my property. And I've been told now that that is, I cannot, um, that we, I cannot include your information in my questioning regarding the EPA. I do have several other questions about this um, because in your appraisal it says uh, your exhibition, it says that there's a very significant date in here. It says that the remedial investigation started on 3 March 21st, 2007. Did you also include the remedial investigation that you claim as part of your information that the property is contaminated to? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the date you just mentioned and I don't fully understand your question. Page 15. Oh, I see. It says remedial investigation started. That's the one that you're referring to. Oh, And gotcha. claiming that my property is contaminated mm -hmm. as information and facts. Okay, so what was your question about that? Did you also include the other remedial investigations that were extended and addressed regarding so, my property? Again, these last few pages are printed straight from EPA website. 
Um, I didn't feel I needed to go much further than what they're reporting on their website. The next page 16 has a bunch of other dates on it, if those are the ones that you are talking about, um, as well as the next one, page 17. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how to address your question. These pages, I did not create these pages. These are straight from the website. So I, I'm not really sh sure what more to say about them. So your information is an assumption. Is that correct? I am assuming the EPA's website is accurate since they are the governing body. Back to page three in regards to coastal development CDI. Under A, it says the purpose of CDI subzone is to provide areas of those types of energy and industrial activities that require location ad adjacent to or in the vicinity of the sea to function. The intent of the subzone is to assure that energy and industrial land uses will neither generate environmental degradation or nor otherwise adversely affect public welfare. Development within CDI subzones shall be consistent with policies 50, 54, 56 of the Oxnard Coastal Land Use Plan, 64 Code, Section 34-2.10.1. Are all those words directly out of the C CDI definition? Yes or no? So, so that italicized section there. All of that is copied and pasted from the city of Oxnard. These are not my words. When you put subject description, you're imposing that this property is only CDI. Is that correct? According to the city of Oxnard, yes. That's the current zoning. Did you account for any vested non-conforming uses whatsoever? No. Do you know who the prior owner of this property before the Hack Family Trust? I don't deem that to be relevant to the valuation issue. Mr. Stan, I just want to remind you that you will have a chance to make your own presentation as well. If you have information that contradicts uh, the assessor's um, appraisal report, that would be an ideal time to present it. Right now, it's best to focus on specific questions that you need answered from the assessor. If you have things that are really more statements, those would be best um, done in your presentation. Sir, uh, at the beginning of this um, hearing, I was given this uh, Supplemental A, uh, exib Exhibit A and Exhibit B, so I'm just asking questions that are relevant uh, to this. Um, am I being pressed to shorten this time, or are we here to get to the valuation? Um, again, I don't know what you have to present, but I'm suggesting, based on the nature of your questions, it sounds like you may have information that would be best presented in your presentation rather than in questions. However, if you have material questions for the assessor, um, by all means, ask them. Thank you, sir. You mentioned in item B that there are conditionally permitted uses. Uh, 
item, oh, exhibit B, or what are you referencing? Um, subject description on page three. Oh, I see. B. Okay, yeah, that's the Oxnard's, the city of Oxnard's description of the CDI zoning. Okay. Have you read the 16, uh, 615 page um, information that I submitted to the disc hearing? I have uh, viewed it, yes. You have read every page? I've not read every page. I skimmed through most of it to deem what I thought was relevant for valuation issues. Did you see any errors on part of the tax assessor? Modification of numbers, moving of numbers? That's expired ex engineers so stamps? That would be, I believe, those types of issues were handled in the hearing uh, back in 20, was it 2020? Yeah, back in 20, June 29, 2020, I think a lot of those issues were discussed and handled. Today, we're only talking about valuation. This is part of the evaluation, and I'm asking you as an expert. Mr. San Augustine, if I can interrupt again. Um, this is questions about the assessor's presentation that they just made. I feel that it is connected. Um, if it is, could get to it quickly? I did, sir. And he just answered. Okay. You say in your report in ex Exhibit 1, Exhibit A, um, that the Originally, the assessor's determination of change of ownership occurred on May 8, 2019, as the subject's history. Is there more history before that date of May 8, 2019? Yeah, I wasn't going to go into the entire history of the subject. I went into basically what's relevant for this appeal. Should that date actually in your report be January 8th, 2019 versus 2000, uh, uh, May 8th? No, I clarified further in the other paragraphs. I was saying what originally happened in the assessor's office, and then I said how the June 2020 hearing changed these facts, and the applicant and assessor at that time were both in agreement with the board's decision. You've represented to the board and myself that the property is contaminated. Is that true? Yes. Under the EPA information that you submitted right here, Did you know it's missing the cleanup that was performed in a 45 day period back in 2007? I'm simply, I'm simply going off of what the EPA is reporting here. So they're the, they're the authority. I simply, took what they said. I didn't feel the need to investigate further than what their website is reporting. None of these issues were raised to me prior to today. This report that you submitted for the last two years 
is not what has been represented to the public. Was there a tax system change in November 31st, 2021 with the assessor on their software? Oh, um, yeah, we switched from an old system to a new system, yes. Does that information refer to the exact information that is represented to us today? I don't understand your question. This is, this is Steve Bates. Let me with, restate that question. This is Steve Bates with the assessor. Mr. San Augustine, we've answered your questions and the question you're currently asking regarding our system after the fact of the date of January 8th, 2019, I don't believe is relevant to our case presentation today. You said you don't believe. We're not going to go I, into the I need details. Facts. Excuse and we're at a tax me. hearing. I, I would I, agree. I, I concur as well. I would concur that, that it is not relevant. I would have to disagree with you that it is very relevant. Because the board has indicated that they don't find the question relevant, which means that the assessor does not have to answer the question. Okay. Uh, Brendan, uh, what is the order of how the, what is next after after so the if, assessor? If you've completed all your questions, the, the board will ask questions. To the assessor? Correct. Uh, if, I mean the appraiser, is that correct? They will ask questions of the assessor. Okay. So if, if you have no further questions at this time? No, I, I, do, I do have some further questions. My valuation was based um, in my application, according to energy, or according to types of energy and industrial activities specific to that property. The entire coastline of Oxnard is energy related is that correct? I didn't review the entire coastline of Oxnard, but I can tell you the subject is zoned for that. Is the comps, are the comps that you submitted, are they energy? Uh, Industrial activities? No. Oh, let, me, let me double check. No, are they, they located are on the ocean? No, they are not. Did you know there is a fire hydrant in front of my property with curb, gutter, and street, and sewer? Full utilities? You mean on your direct property? Correct. No, I didn't review that. Do you know if the Oxnard wastewater treatment plant is using my property as a land treatment or curtain drain to handle their biosolids? Can you please direct us to our presentation as to 
how how that question comes into play. That question comes into play because I read it here. That you referred to the city of Oxnard, where it said the intent on item A under subject description says the intent of the subzone is to assure that the energy and industrial land uses will neither generate environmental degradation nor otherwise adversely affect the public welfare development within a CID subzone shall be consistent with policies and so forth to the end. So I'm gonna repeat what Mr. Phillips um, mentioned a few minutes ago on page three under subjects description the italicized section which you just quoted right now is comes straight from the website from city of oxnard so he's not claiming to have written this part he stated in his presentation that this came from the website so you're asking us to speak and explain something that came directly from the city of oxnard website that you are submitting as uh, data and documenting evaluation as right. an assumption. Is that correct? It's not an assumption. We copied and pasted and mentioned that in our presentation that this comes from the website. Now, you asked a question in regards to that <clears throat> that I still don't see how, how that's relevant. Because you don't see the entire picture. Mr. San Augustine, again, this is for questions about their presentation. I'm going to ask you to, if you have statements, whether they're in the form of a question or not, they're best held until your presentation. Um, asking the assessor about something that's not in their presentation um, really isn't appropriate. For example, the existence of the fire hydrant. The fact that it wasn't in the presentation, I think, is sufficient for all of us to conclude that they didn't consider that. I asked those questions to get to the facts of whether there was access or not. And I understand that the valuation was given to me absent access. And you have the opportunity to make that statement in your presentation. If I may clarify, I mentioned it a few times. My conclusion on access was inconclusive. So I did not adjust positively or negatively for the subject's access because I was able, unable to determine its access. Based on what I was looking at, I see that the street does not lead fully to the location of the subject. I was unable to ascertain if there's an easement through the adjacent property. Therefore, I was unable to conclusively say if there is reasonable access or not to the subject property. Those have been my statements from the beginning. Okay, Mr. Chair, um, the board, how our process works is the board takes the testimony and the evidence and we put up whatever weight we determine to be appropriate um, to the presentations. So the board is here to do their job and, and weigh the evidence before us. So we'll look at the assessor's evidence and we'll look at your evidence and we'll apply what weight we deem appropriate. So we're not trying to um, keep you from presenting information. It's more about when you're going to do it. So this is really focused on getting clarification about specific information in the assessor's um, 
appraisal. Uh, I, I, I feel they've more than answered your questions about your specific questions. I heard a lot of statements in the form of a question, and again, you, you can do that during your presentation. Like if you want to bring up the fact that there's um, a fire hydrant, that's a better time to do it. And it won't, it, it, it's not taken away from your, from your time at all. I had these questions on there. Um, in regards to valuation from the assessor, um, and I'm answering you, it, to me, it, um, it wasn't exact. And okay, I'm done with my questions for now. Thank you, Mr. Santa Guest. And uh, does the board have questions for the assessor? Anyone? <clears throat> I do not. Okay. I just have one thing I just want to verify in, in case it affects anything. Um, the, the assessor is basing the $4 million off of a 2017 purchase that was a reported sales price that was accepted but for the January 8th valuation, there was no reported sales price. So you are independently appraising it as of the January 2019 transfer. Is that correct? Yes, that sounds accurate. Yeah, there's no reported sales price for the January 8th, 2019 change in ownership. Um, the December 8, 2017 is a comp. It's our basically our main comparable that gets the most weight, followed by two supporting comps. Um, but yeah, does that? Yeah, does I that just because say, say there wasn't the raise letter, there would be the the purchase price presumption. And I'm just trying to clarify. There was no reported sales price. Correct. So it's, um, there's no sales price. Currently in dispute, it's just independent appraisals. That's correct. Yes. Okay. And and you're today you're asking the board to sustain the four million dollars, and then how it gets factored with the base value is just all mathematical calculations. Basically, yes. So if if the board agrees with the assessor's forty mil or four million, then um, they would also be agreeing to how we calculate the base year factoring and blending of the two base year values. So that was all mostly informational purposes, but really their decision comes down to, is it 4 million as of January 8th, 2019? Thank you. Um, board member Little has a question. Yes, I have one quick question. Uh, the application states the assessor parcel number is 231-0-032-124. Uh, and your presentation has uh, 231-0032-125-35-135-155 and 175. I, I think they're on subsequent pages. So, there, so that you should have, I, I believe there's four uh, yes, applications? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, Vice Chair Little, there are four applications. I've stapled them all together. Oh, okay. double-sided oh, okay so there are uh, part of uh, I, I don't want to reopen this because it's already been decided but back in 2020 there was a uh, discussion on the parcels to be addressed by the appeal and mm -hmm. it was is determined by the board at that time mm -hmm. that it would only be addressing these four parcels on which appeals were filed for oh, okay that's just what I wanted to clarify excellent okay thank you you're welcome and I have a question too oh. mm -hmm. um, it's all has to do with the, the factoring. Um, okay, so my understanding is that when you originally thought there was 100% change in ownership, you, val you valued the whole property, so the 20% the plus the 80% at $4 million. Yes. And then we, when it was only a 20% change of ownership, we did the $4 million for the 20%, but then we factored the 80%. Yes. With the 80%, why does it get factored if the assessor's office determined that the fair market value was lower than the factored value? It's because uh, basically the, let me, let me uh, turn to page nine. I'll try my best to explain. That, this is where it gets a bit complicated. But um, so if you look at the original transfer that represents the 80%, it was December 8th, 2017. 
So every year from that date, it gets the appropriate Prop 13 factoring. So that continues um, when we're doing this 80%. So the reason why we did the factoring on this spreadsheet is because what we're doing here is we're saying as of December 8, 2017, what was the value enrolled, right? Not the factored value, the original enrolled fair market value. So that's 1,064,500, okay? And then what this spreadsheet does is it applies the appropriate Prop 13 factoring for the remaining years until it reaches the same uh, date as the January 2019 date. Does that somewhat make sense? So, so we're starting, so for December 8, 2017, we take the value that was enrolled, we're taking 80% of that value, and then we're saying when it goes through each year, we have to apply each of the appropriate factoring to that just 80%. And this is a supplemental assessment, and so you wouldn't do basically like a Prop 8 value on that 80%? No, not typically, no. Because okay. we're, we're saying here's the Prop 13 for that 80%, here's the new Prop 13 for that 19%, and we blend them together. And that's the basically the result there. Okay, does that help? <laughs> Sorry. The, the PI worksheets do get a little complicated. Right. Okay. It, does, it, it would get evaluated, per se, in later years, the following year, if, if it is uh, deemed worthy of a, of a Prop 8 reduction, if and that I makes sense. I think that that's probably where my okay. question lies, so I think we got there. Yeah, Thank you. okay. <laughs> okay, got that figured out. Um, so, Brendan, would the next step be for uh, Mr. San Augustine to make his presentation? Correct. Okay. So, I don't know if the board would like to uh, do a lunch break unless Mr. San Augustine indicates it's you know, less than a 30 minute presentation. Yes. How long is your presentation expected to take today with your, all your statements? Um, I'd just like to get through it. But how long? An, an hour, two hours? How long do you think you would speak for? My presentation? Yes. Um, I don't know. What time is it right now? It is uh, 12.20. 12 <clears throat> um, I would say uh, maybe 30 minutes, if I had to assume. Might be able to get through and get this done within the next 30 minutes. Um, so what we'll have is you'll present your side and then the assessor's office will ask questions, and then we will ask questions, and then there'll be closing arguments after that. So there's gonna be another opportunity for each side to speak after you present and we ask questions. So we're trying to figure out if all of that is gonna take more than 45 minutes or not. So we can go to lunch either I, I, I at one it, or take off now, come back at 1.15, and then just roll through everything in the next two hours and be done with it in one shot. I, I would like to just get through it and get moving. Based on Mr. San Augustine's uh, statements and the historic, this would probably at least take another two to three hours, so we should probably take a lunch break. It seems like a logical place yeah. to take a lunch break because that way um, we can follow up your presentation, Mr. San Augustine, with uh, direct questions while everything's fresh in our minds and given the time. So Without having to take a break between closing statements. Yeah. So can we take a, we'll take a one hour lunch break? Is that? That's yep. good. Good. Return at 1.30, just round it up to 1.30. 1.30. Does that sound good? That's can fine. We say, can we say 1.45? I might as well go to lunch, too, and, you know, I got more steps than any of you do since I'm out of town. 1.45, that's that's a considerable lunch. Um, there's plenty well, of yeah, it's an hour restaurants and really close. There's cafeteria minutes. downstairs and then down. Oh, there's a cafeteria? Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. And then down <laughs> Telegraph, yeah. there's like I could do 10 hour. restaurants between here and the freeway. I don't, I, I have my wife drop me off. Okay. I'll, I'll speak yeah. with Mr. San Augustine during the break on some options. All right. Okay, so 1.30? So 1.30. We turn at 1.30. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no, we are just...
Okay, hopefully everyone had a nice lunch. Um, we're going to start with uh, Mr. San Augustine. Um, uh, you're free to make your presentation. Okay. Um, I submitted an application and I asked for specific numbers in regards to, in that application, the valuation of my property. Um, it's very, uh, it's black and white. Um, my application does my speaking, and then I supported it with uh, 615 pages. In that 615 pages, in the four items that are identical with the exception of parcel numbers and valuation, I gave uh, a prayer of four items. Um, I asked that the land that was taken from me, that was connected to the 27 and the 11 acres, um, includes in the 11 acres, um, legal description, was uh, illegally removed from uh, ownership by uh, the municipalities and their task force, and the tax assessor um, labeled uh, portions of those properties with parcel numbers. In that book that I gave you, it identifies uh, approximately, I believe, 181 parcels. Um, in my claim, um, I'm pointing out that it, it uh, is connected to abuse, waste, and fraud. Um, and uh, I put out that message to the county uh, board of supervisors. Um, so that this is a soft approach to you to make you aware um, that I would like to come to the table and speak with you and to work this whole situation out. <clears throat> it's very important uh, that the valuation that I've requested in the application meets those numbers. And the reason for that is because the opportunity um, that is I'm offering to Ventura County and the municipalities and their task forces is would uh, benefit them greatly. I'm not here to make enemies. Um, I'm here to uh, uh, bring an olive branch and get us all on the same page. And I sincerely and honestly mean that. I can tell you that because I have proof right now that has gone on outside of these walls and these chambers um, that have are considering this, um, what I'm saying. It's taken me a few years to do, do that. I would like to uh, also say that what I'm saying was not done in the dark or uh, is very, uh, um, is known by Ventura County and I would presume by their legal counsel also and I say that because it's on the record um, on December 14th, 2010, and uh, on a portion of what I'm saying. The information now that is contained in the tax assessor's database in their software, it shows many, many huge problems still, including properties that are when you run them, and when you run them, their location has changed several times. I can understand why the appraiser would be confused about the road, because on their maps and with the city of Oxnard, that particular subdivision is moved, I believe, two or three times. Um, when the, in the language that is presented to the public now, it's becoming more diffused and the public is becoming a lot more aware of um, mistakes and misspeakings and they're unforgiving and uh, they, are out, they are out now. Quite a few people that are backing me up have taken this to uh, attorneys and they've looked at it and uh, it's very loud. So, in this, today I received a letter, I believe in May. Um, I don't 
want to uh, continue pushing on Ventura County. I've made my statement, I think it's pretty loud. I did not expect this. If I would have known that this would have been here, I, I probably would have been more exact and maybe not been so forward with these gentlemen. I didn't intend to do that. Um, honestly, I intended to come here and um, uh, get my letter. You guys stamped me out and um, uh, and it's on public record now. So with that being said, I um, am kindred and I want to be a part of uh, this fantastic area. I live in San Diego in a really nice area. And I know what I'm saying. And I'm heavily documented. Um, this is only a portion. And by the way, I did not submit 60 days ago evidence to you that I could have brought here today. And uh, I did not do that because I think it's futile. I believe that the decision is already made and predetermined and, and we're going through the motions. And um, I don't wish to um, hit or push on Ventura County Tax Assessor anymore. Um, I would like to say that there is a, a huge opportunity, again, I like to say that again, for uh, Ventura County and I understand the story uh, of what's going on completely. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to uh, move on with this, and that's my opening presentation. Okay, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Uh, I may yes, interject here, um, and I'll check with counsel. As far as jurisdiction, this board can look at the specific assessor parcel number, the specific year that we've been presented by the assessor. I'm not sure if this is something jurisdictional that is within our boundaries. That's correct. What the, what the board can do is the board can decide, can hear the arguments about the value of the specific assessor's parcel number that are at issue today. Um, any issues outside of that related to like whether there has been fraud, waste, and abuse, or whether there's been some sort of improper taking are not within the board's jurisdiction to determine. It is, it is purely valuation that the board can, can decide today. Okay. Is there a, a pending case to the applicant? Is there a, a pending litigation or a case that we need to, you know, maybe postpone our decision until we hear the results of this case as far as the taking goes? I'm quite familiar with eminent domain. Um, very familiar. In fact, I, I've been in an eminent domain case where the, the city has uh, used inverse condemnation and taken my property and used it for public purposes several times. I've also been uh, with the state of California and understand eminent domain. I wish to keep this out of the legal court. I don't believe that. Um, uh, I believe uh, with what I understand about Ventura County and the city of Oxnard, it is best to resolve our, with talking and I've come uh, not to take it all. I haven't come to do that. I've come to uh, be an asset to both uh, uh, entities, and I believe I've proved that. I just needed to let you know that I understand. And the valuation, yes, is absolutely critical to have that. But on point number four, it makes reference to that revenue and fees because the county of Ventura and the city of Oxnard have been collecting fees off of wastewater, stormwater, and recycled water that rightfully belong to me. It is in my deed. It is on the record. And that's why I talk about the legal description. And because of that, there could be, or there would be a compensation for that. I'm not going for that. I'm not, I'm not throwing that on top of you. I'm saying, let's, let's, let's look at this and let's work it out between us all. I understand. I, I completely understand. So I want to work with you. That's what I want to do. The valuation is absolutely critical. 
and and I can go on about valuation and the appraisal, um, and uh, I'm seeking to work with you folks. That's what I'm seeking to do, I'm not seeking to impose. Mm -hmm. Okay, and mm -hmm. I don't definitely want, don't want to uh, litigate. Although I do know which what to do in my next step, and I do know what it would cost me. Okay, and so it, uh, it seems like you are exhausting your administrative remedies. Remedies, is that correct? Basically, by coming to the board here, ex you're exhausting what methods you have before you take the next step. I am, you could say that is a portion of it, but I really believed <coughs> driving through your city, um, maybe a naive that uh, truth is what we're all looking for. And the truth of the matter, um, if it came down to a paycheck or revenue and fees to Ventura County, um, uh, that would be my truth to you because you would prosper uh, and so would the city uh, of, of Oxnard. The information that I am giving you isn't just what I made up. This has been vetted by some very heavy people and, and uh, who have been tried in court and have resumes that are extremely strong. And it was told to me that if I go to the next step in the legal, my chances are very, very high that I would uh, uh, prevail. Mm -hmm. I still believe that I'm, I'm, I wake up every day believing that we're all going to do the right thing in God's time. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you for the answer. Thank you, Mr. San Augustine. Um, any other questions? No. <clears throat> Is that the entirety of your presentation? That's pretty much it. I do have a couple questions for the board. Okay. Let's see. Um, if, well, I mean, procedurally, uh, up to you. the assessor has to ask questions. Right. Um, okay. Uh, so if that's everything, uh, we would turn to the assessor and ask if they have questions for you. I guess my question is, do you, did you want to talk about your valuation or do you feel the evidence submitted is uh, speaks for itself. The evidence that you submitted to me, it can be recognized as a different facet of valuation. I don't, and my, and it also would include mine, too. So, um, it does. What you presented is a typical uh, appraisal, but doesn't necessarily cover the valuation uh, in regards to energy. And uh, I guess my other question is, what value for your property as of the January transfer date, what value are you asking the board to consider for your property? It would be uh, the value, um, the comps that I used and that are strong uh, across the, uh, the state of California, um, but is very boutique and, and, and very limited data to that. When I say limited data, let's just say very small percentage of the energy, um, the electric energy uh, industry uh, valuates is very interesting. You would understand it if I explained it to you. And skipping that, and to answer your question in a nutshell, I would say using the 1987 SCE, Southern California Edison, um, uh, uh, information that was vetted by an expert, um, uh, uh, that uh, price came out to $15.8 million per acre for energy property. And um, and that is why that supports the continual high prices of electricity from SCE, SDG&E, and PG&E because our land values are escalating and they are valuing their kilowatt hour rate on that land value. So with that, um, I've given you a dummy down price of 
uh, $15.8 million per acre. That's a 1987 comp. Okay, well, one quick second. The second part of that would be the um, back pay or current um, financial responsibility that Ventura and the municipalities would have. And, and I believe that's what the uh, attorney picked up, which I have to tip my hat to you. I don't think anybody would have picked that up as quick as you did, but you picked it up. And, and uh, uh, with that valuation, um, is there a probability that I'm gonna go to court and, and, and try to collect on that? The answer is, I'm here to work with everyone and that I have credible sources in this inventory county that will stand by me and stand with me on that. I give you my word. I've been strong with my word, okay? And, and so I would forego that and I would put it in writing for uh, after our discussions. Okay, so just for clarification, 15.8 million per acre would translate to 415 million 540,000, that's what you believe the property is worth? That's what I know that the property is worth, um, correct. Okay, um, I believe that would be all of the assessor's questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does the board have any questions? <clears throat> I do. Um, <clears throat> I have your application, and there's you know four parcels on here, so I went through and I added up your the applicant's opinion of value on each one, and it adds up to about $500 million. Uh, I'm sorry? Um, I took, on your application, you have written down what you think your property is worth. So I added those up real quick in my head. It's about $500 million for the four parcels. Yes, that's correct. Um, do you have any support for that? Absolutely. Did you want to present it today or not? Uh, no, not today. Okay. I, I represented it uh, in the. I, I, I represented it in the uh, in the uh, um, my application, and uh, uh, I dealt with the the issue of contamination um, on, on on adding that to the uh, appraisal value or a, a component in valuation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Any other questions from the board? <laughs> I don't have any. Um, uh, I have one, Mr. San Augustine. Um, how does, um, I see you have an appraisal in your um, packet. Yes, sir. How does that relate to your, to the number that, um, that you, this approximately five hundred million <clears throat> that you have on your application. How does the appraised value relate to that? Um, uh, the reason why I put that in there, first of all, is I had no dealings with that whatsoever. None. Uh, it was given to me uh, uh, after I had the ownership uh, of the property or a portion of the ownership of the property. It was given to me, and uh, I can't remember whether it was given to me by Sam Samuels or uh, my partner uh, Eddie Awada. Okay. Um, so I placed it in the package uh, to make a point that um, uh, the, there is a higher price um, than an appraiser supported that. Uh, whether I agree on the points like the appraiser professionally um, uh, said, uh, um, uh, I couldn't say I do. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that it had to be very specific towards energy projects. Um, my neighbor across the way, which is actually Halliburton, Halliburton owns the property or Indy Paper Place, they have a power plant in there. Mm -hmm. It's, I believe, a 29 megawatt power plant. About four or five years ago, they refied for about $80 million, about 10 acres. And, and uh, I, know, I remember it was $80 million. And, and so I just felt like it was a no-brainer, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, there are 27 permits uh, for electric generation in uh, the city of Oxnard. 
the, the whole coastal area. And on the record, uh, former deceased um, pro tem mayor, uh, Car Ms. Mrs. Carmen Mare uh, Ramirez uh, mentioned that uh, there was power, that the coastal part of all of Oxnard um, was uh, power generation. So um, that's how I came to the, the simple, uh, uh, simple part. I do have a comp, very strong. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, is it in your? Is it in the binder? Your I'm sorry. Your, your comp is it in the binder? No, oh, my, okay. my my comp is not in the binder. Okay. No. You didn't want to present it. Uh, I felt that. <laughs> Honestly, if you, someone came and, and asked for a raise on the on the uh, on their property to pay more property taxes, um, that that would be a no-brainer, <laughs> and I know that's untypical. Okay, but I think what put the squash on it is item number four on R four the uh, applications, which is potentially uh, saying that there are uh, there's money that goes along with that, and to credit and debit properly uh, would be a standard task and I'm willing to, like I said, uh, forego that and come to an understanding with Ventura County and the municipalities. I wanna fight, I wanna do good. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, closing? <clears throat> now would be time for the applicants to present their closing statements and, and we, the assessor's office will follow. And we start with the applicant? Yep. Okay, okay. Thanks. Yeah. thanks for. Putting up with my uh, <laughs> my greenness today. This is my first day doing running the show, but we have very talented people here who know what Brendan, uh, you know, foremost among them. So we would start with you uh, closing arguments, and then we'd finish with the assessor. So if you have anything else you want to add, like in as a closing, this is your opportunity to do that. I, I just wanted to ask one question. Um, or, or, you know, the, the question may have sub-questions. But I, I, I'm just kind of curious. Well, maybe not curious, but maybe curious. <laughs> I'm wondering why uh, the rest of the board is not here, and, and especially Mrs. Uh, I can't see her name. What, the the gal that was sitting here? Oh, Mary Ferris? We actually have two assessment appeals boards. Uh, we are assessment appeals board number two, and um, the other three, well, actually, Mr. Sisk is part of uh, Assessment Appeals Board 1. This, the three of us um, are serving for, this is a special yeah. hearing. Um, Myself and Miss Little sat on the first time you were here in 2020. Yes, I, I was in I charge of that. I remember Miss, Miss Little and um, Miss, Mr., I think it's Sisk. Yeah. Ski. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so um, that's, okay. and so we wanted to preserve the same team as well as we can. Oh, I so see. So sometimes okay. when, when things roll forward, we try to keep the same members. Oh, I see. Okay. It. So okay. this is like a combination of two boards, which is mm -hmm. right. Yeah. But to seem to work better. A, a full board is three members, not yeah. not additional. So you're okay. you have a full only three people are allowed to vote on your case, and so we have three board members serving. Correct. Thank thank you. Okay. It was a little different because this mm -hmm. was yeah. our annual meeting where we all combined together. Right. So oh, I the see. other okay. members, you know, were from the board number one. Right. So that's pretty much one time a year you'll see all of us <laughs> <laughs> together. The only the time, only yeah. Right. right. Okay. Oh, are you waiting for me to come? Any okay. other uh, comments or closing remarks? Uh, am I due a closing remark? Are, 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 is, is you the, get to make your closing you statements now, and then the assessor's office will make their closing statements after that, and then at some point we'll talk about our decision. I will, I will not waive, here are my closing marks, I will not waive the application uh, commitment <coughs> if it was black and white of what I've stated here. This is only a portion and a soft evidence of what I have. Um, I believe that there and is a huge opportunity um, for Ventura County. There is a, there are people in Ventura County that are involved in, in government and energy and agree with me. And the information that I'm bringing here today um, uh, 
and evaluation. I believe either way will find its way and get daylight. Um, I would like to say um, that I would be glad to accept a pause uh, with all with with the municipalities and um, and not to enforce uh, one of the items uh, uh, number four um, in regards to, in regards to revenue and fees, so it wouldn't be become punitive, and you could work with me. Um, and uh, help unwind this uh, and make it good. Um, so with that being said, um, I am uh, pressing out to you uh, uh, the faith that you would do the right thing, the hope that you would do the right thing and the mutual love that we would share uh, for people and community. So with that, um, I'm finished. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, the assessor. Thank you. So um, the assessor just wants to say that um, we hope this case shows that um, as with all cases, the the assessor's not um, out to find the highest value possible. Uh, we are out to determine what is fair market value for properties. Um, yeah, we could have possibly gone the stipulation route and stipulated to a much higher value and possibly uh, helped out the county in some way with that. Um, but we pride ourselves on determining fair market value uh, for all cases. Uh, that's the case for this one. So um, based on the available comps, we determined 4 million seemed to be the accurate fair market value for the subject property. Um, I listed in my presentation some of the kind of glaring issues I saw with the appraisal that was provided in the applicant's um, uh, presentation. Um, and with that, we just asked the board to sustain the assessor at 4 million with the appropriate partial, in partial interest transfer uh, calculations that were made for that. Um, and that'd be it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, the board will take into consideration all the information presented. Um, um, Mr. St. Augustine, I hope, you've, I hope you felt heard today. We, we, we really tried to hear you. And I also hope you understand uh, the limitations of our powers and our jurisdiction in this. Um, they're, they're fairly limited <laughs> as far as what we're actually tasked with doing. Um, and that is um, uh, um, taking a look at the value, the 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 a fair market value of the property based on each side's presentation. Um, we will take all that information into consideration and we will um, meet and meet. Um, Brendan will notify him just right uh, Yes, Brendan will notify you once we have our decision. Um, and and okay. County Council will prepare the uh, written findings of fact. Okay. Yeah, you've asked for written findings of fact. Yes. yes, it's my understanding he's going to coordinate payment with the clerk of the board, and then, yes, I'll prepare the findings of fact after the minute order is issued. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, okay that else. does it for you, you. Um, sir. Yep. Board, mem board members, oh, we just right. have one quick agenda item left before you adjourn to deliberations. It's item 18. Are we finished? Yes, thank you. Thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you. May I pay? Yes. By 150 bucks? Yes, I'll, I'll be done with the meeting in just a sure. minute. Yeah, let's, we have a couple little housekeeping things to do, and then we're going to go to the back, and then you can, you can talk to Brandon. This, uh, so the stipulation agreements were emailed to your board last mm -hmm. Friday. If you had a chance to review, the recommended action is to approve. Uh, yes, I received them and reviewed them. I've reviewed them. Yes. I move to approve. Uh, I second. All right, any objections to that motion? And none. That passes. Chair Leonetta, we're all done with business for today. If you'd like to adjourn to closed session. Yes, uh, we're adjourned. Thank you.